Victor Shoemaker Jr. Born March 30th of 1989, Victor Dwight Shoemaker Jr. was his parents' miracle child. Victor Sr. and his wife Nettie had been attempting to have their own child for years, but it never happened. That is, until finally, Nettie became pregnant in 1988. In the spring of 1994, the Shoemakers took Victor, who was five at the time, along with them to visit his grandfather in Kirby, West Virginia, for a family reunion. The home was on the outskirts of Short Mountain, a long, relatively low mountain of about 8,000 acres. Victor was very excited about the trip because he adored playing outdoors. Whenever he had the opportunity, he could be found paddling in nearby creeks and climbing trees. The only time Nettie let her son out of her sight was when they arrived at the house and Victor was given permission to play with his cousins in the woods behind the mobile home. And that's exactly what Victor did on the morning of May 1st at around 8 a.m. The young boy was being supervised by his cousins, Tommy, who was nine, and Lloyd, who was eight. According to the boys, the pair wanted to play with their BB guns, so they headed further into the woods, leaving Victor struggling to catch up. By the time they reached a small abandoned trailer, the five-year-old told them he was hungry and wanted to go home. Neither of the children offered to take him back, so Victor began his journey to his grandfather's trailer alone at around 8.30 a.m. However, Victor would never make it back home. It wasn't long before a search was launched in an attempt to quickly locate the five-year-old before darkness fell. Hundreds of local people turned up to help find him and eventually helicopters were put to use and divers searched nearby ponds and creeks. The forest was dense and the chances of recovering Victor seemed to be growing smaller. A volunteer firefighter noted, quote, some of the brush is pretty heavy and there are areas where you can't see 10 feet in front of you. During the search, an adult cousin of Victor's found what she thought might have been a sleeping spot for the little boy. Three rocks were placed in the shape of a triangle with a stick in the middle, while three logs had been placed to the side. There was also freshly disturbed dirt next to it. Of the discovery, Victor's cousin said, it looked like someone trying to build a house. After five days of combing through the scrub, the search for the little boy was called off. In the months following, the National Guard and Army Reserve units attempted to locate Victor, but were unsuccessful. In 1997, the FBI announced their interest in a dark blue 1990 pickup truck that was seen in the area at the time Victor vanished. It's unknown if the driver has any connection to the case, but investigators were keen to talk to them about what, if anything, they had seen. This car has never been located. At the time of Victor's disappearance, authorities stated their belief that the young boy had gotten lost and tragically died from exposure. The terrain in the area is rough and rocky, and in the days following his vanishing, the weather was cold and rainy. It seemed unlikely that the five-year-old would have been able to survive the harsh conditions without shelter. However, Victor's parents do not believe that he got lost, claiming that the young boy was very familiar with the area. When initially questioned about his whereabouts, Victor's cousins, Tommy and Lloyd, reportedly gave the wrong location of where he was last seen. However, the pair were meant to be looking after him and were not meant to be playing by the abandoned trailer, so they probably didn't want to get into trouble, meaning this is not necessarily evidence of something strange going on. According to one report, when asked about what they thought had happened to Victor, one of his cousins is alleged to have said, somebody hiding behind a tree got up and grabbed him or shot him. Victor Sr. believes that Tommy and Lloyd know more than they are letting on, although he does not believe the pair are involved in any way. Speaking to the Charleston Gazette Mail, Victor Sr. said that when he attempted to speak to the boys after they returned from the woods, they wouldn't say anything about it. Both children were given a play therapy exam and a polygraph test shortly after Victor's vanishing, and both passed. One of the mothers of the boys was also given a polygraph test, as was Victor Sr. Again, both passed. Reportedly, Nettie, 
Victor's mother was not asked to take one. There are many theories surrounding the disappearance of Victor Shoemaker Jr. Some suspect that he fell victim to a careless hunter, while others agree with the police theory that he simply succumbed to the elements. Reportedly, investigators ruled out the theory that the young boy was abducted, because there is only one main road that passes through the remote area, and it is rarely used. However, Victor's parents, and some of the locals, believe he was abducted by a stranger. According to several reports, during the search, a sniffer dog kept its nose in the air and traced the five-year-old scent through a field and then to a road before halting. This has suggested to some that perhaps Victor was carried through the field before being placed in a car. Of the abduction theory, Victor Sr. stated his belief that his son had been abducted and raised by another family. He says he likely has a new identity and remembers nothing of his old life. Others have speculated that perhaps he was the victim of an unfortunate accident and his cousins were too scared to say. It has also been postulated that maybe Tommy and Lloyd saw something, but again, were too afraid to tell anybody. However, these are all just theories, and without any evidence, none of them can be close to proven. In 2004, the Charlie Project shed light on the case again, hoping to attract new information and jog somebody's memory. However, nothing substantial came of this appeal. In 2014, authorities announced that all investigative leads have been exhausted. That same year, Victor Sr. gave an interview and said, We're hanging in there, but we sure would love to hear something. Since the tragic disappearance, the shoemakers don't speak with their cousins or their families. It's unclear who decided to stop speaking to who, but it has been noted that the families of Tommy and Lloyd refuse to speak to the media. If Victor is still alive, he would be 32 years old this year. If you have any information about his case, you can contact the FBI at 202-324-3000. Nileen Marshall. Nileen K. Marshall was born on September 18th, 1978. A playful and kind-hearted young girl, she was born in Orange County, California, and had one older brother and one younger sister. At the time of her disappearance in the early 1980s, she and her siblings lived with Nileen's biological mother Nancy and her stepfather Kim in Clancy, Montana. On June 25th, 1983, Nancy and Kim decided to have a picnic with friends and family members at a campground in the Helena National Forest in the Elkhorn Mountains, a mountain range in the southwest of Montana. There are slightly differing reports about Nileen's last movements. Most sources, including the Charlie Project, state that the four-year-old had been playing with other children, but lagged behind when they headed towards a beaver dam. When they looked around, she was gone. However, several articles have stated that Nileen was being looked after by a 13-year-old girl who had to return to the campground for just a moment. The girl told Nileen to stay put, but when she returned, Nileen had vanished. Either way, Nileen was nowhere to be found. Law enforcement extensively searched the campground but found no sign of her. A police dog briefly caught her scent but lost it during the search. The odds did not look good. The park was filled with thick foliage, rough terrain, wildlife, and harsh weather. Not only that, but abandoned mine shafts littered the area. After nine days of careful exploration, the search was finally called off. One lead did emerge, however, during this time. The children recalled seeing Nileen speaking to a man in a purple jogging suit. He reportedly told the four-year-old to, quote, follow the shadows. According to some articles, he attempted to speak to the other children first, but one was afraid of him and ran off, while the other simply ignored him. Nileen appeared to be the only one who actively engaged with him. It's unknown if this man has anything to do with the vanishing, but he has never been identified. The case grew cold for several years, until November 27th of 1985, when an anonymous man made a phone call to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, claiming that he had abducted Nileen, 
although he referred to her by her middle name, Kay. A few months later, at the beginning of 1986, a typewritten letter was sent to law enforcement in Wisconsin. The letter appeared to be from the same man who'd made the phone call, and stated that he'd picked Nileen up on a road between Helena and Boulder in Elkhorn Park, and decided to take her home with him so that he could care for her. Although excerpts from the letter can be found online, the full piece has never been released to the public, likely because investigators have said that it contains details that were never made public. One detective said that the letter writer was, quote, privy to things that a normal person would not have access to. In his letter, the writer claimed to have a nice investment income and was able to work from home, allowing him to homeschool Nileen. He said he traveled frequently throughout the US, UK, and Canada, and that Nileen always accompanied him and had fun doing so. He claimed not to molest Nileen in any way, but then provided further details of his activities, which certainly indicated that Nileen was exposed to sexual activity. He claimed that he understood her family must miss her, but that he loved her too much to give her up. This disturbing letter was postmarked from Madison, Wisconsin. Around this time, an anonymous caller claiming to be the writer called the non-profit organization Child Find of America multiple times. These calls were traced back to public phone booths, one of which was located near a pharmacy in Edgerton, Wisconsin. Similar phone calls were made to Nileen's parents, who also received letters from this man. Some time after these deeply disturbing calls and letters, a witness came forward, claiming that they had seen a girl resembling Nileen at a restaurant in Janesville, Wisconsin. It appears as if nothing further came of this tip, however. In 1990, the case was featured on the popular TV show Unsolved Mysteries. After watching the program, one viewer called in, stating his belief that Nileen was one of his classmates in Bellingham, Washington. Incredibly, while it turned out the girl was not Nileen, she was a missing person who had been abducted by her non-custodial father. Monica Bonilla had been missing from Burbank, California since 1982. After eight long years, she was finally reunited with her mother. That same year, Nileen's uncle saw two composite sketches for a male and female wanted for child abduction in another part of the US. He believed that he had seen the two during their first day of searching. However, this couple has never been identified. In August of 1991, a man named Richard James Wilson handed himself in, confessing to Nileen's murder. He also claimed to have taken the life of another woman from Great Falls. Wilson reportedly had a history of mental health issues and had been on probation since his 1984 conviction for sexual assault against a minor. Following his confession, Wilson gave investigators directions to where he'd buried the unidentified woman, but no remains were found at the scene. He was also taken to the Elkhorn mountain range, but couldn't tell authorities where he had supposedly buried Nileen. He then recanted his confession and was subsequently released, as the police did not have sufficient evidence to charge him. One of the case's most peculiar leads came in 1997, when a nurse reported a possible sighting of Nileen. According to the witness, a 19-year-old woman and an unidentified man entered the hospital she was working at in Oklahoma to try and get admitted for childbirth. The young woman called herself Helena, and when questioned further, mentioned that she believed her mother's name was Nileen. She apparently remembered little about her childhood and claimed to have grown up in another country, although she had no accent. After staff tried to get more information from the pair, who they found very suspicious, the couple decided to leave. This woman does appear to have been tracked down by law enforcement, and she agreed to have her blood drawn and tested against Nileen's parents. Ultimately, it seems that this woman and her connection to Nileen was eventually ruled out. There is an abundance of theories in Nileen's case. Some believe the man in the purple jogging suit was involved. Others have speculated that she simply wandered off, got lost, and tragically succumbed to the elements. It's been suggested that she was abducted by an unidentified party. Some believe the letters and calls were a hoax, but others are certain that the letter writer is her true captor. 
For a time, many wondered if she was the Racine County Jane Doe, a young woman who suffered horrific abuse before being murdered. However, Jane Doe was finally identified in 2019 as Peggy Lynn Johnson. Another interesting aspect of Nileen's disappearance is that her stepfather, Kim, was once named as a person of interest in her case. It is unclear as to why authorities suspected him of being involved or knowing more than he said he did. By 1994, the Marshall family had relocated to Japan, but tragedy would continue to stalk them. In 1995, in Mexico, Nancy, Nileen's mother, was sexually assaulted and murdered. She was found hanging by a man's belt in her hotel room. Information on her case is scarce, and it appears to remain unsolved. According to some sources, her death was ruled as a suicide, despite the fact she had been raped and her valuables were missing from her hotel room. In 2017, Investigators announced they had no new substantial leads to follow. Nileen's case is still unsolved and grows colder by the day. If she is still alive, Nileen will be 42 this year. If you have any information on her disappearance, you can contact the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office at 406-225-4075. Barbara Follett Born in Hanover, New Hampshire, on March 4th of 1914, Barbara Newhall Follett seemed destined for greatness. Her father, Wilson, was a literary editor, critic, and university lecturer, while her mother, Helen, was a children's writer. It came as no surprise to either parent when Barbara began to exhibit a creative flair for writing following the start of her homeschooling sessions. The little girl excelled in writing and reading activities, and by the age of four, she had begun to write her own poetry. Barbara's writing often dealt with the themes of nature and the wilderness. Her first novel, The House Without Windows, revolved around a young girl who ran away from home to live in nature with the animals. The book was published in 1927, when Barbara was just 12 years old, and it was praised up and down the nation. Her second book was published when she was just 14, and, once again, was critically acclaimed. However, despite her promising career, vivid imagination, and endless talent, Barbara was living under a cloud. In the lead-up to her parents' separation in 1928, her father had begun to spend more and more time in New York, where he'd met and fallen for a woman 20 years his junior. The separation of her parents devastated Barbara, who was very close to her father. Reportedly, he was the biggest supporter of her creative endeavors, and he essentially abandoned her following the divorce. Not willing to quit just yet, however, Barbara encouraged her mother to start anew. Helen placed her other daughter, Sabra, into the care of a family member before she and Barbara headed off to start a new adventure sailing from New York to Barbados and exploring the Caribbean islands. While traveling to Washington in 1929, Barbara met 25-year-old Edward Anderson. He became her closest companion, and Barbara ultimately fell in love with him. But the relationship Barbara wanted never took off, and she returned to the US with her mother. From here, she enrolled in university, but quickly decided it wasn't for her and ran away to San Francisco. By all accounts, Barbara appears to have led a turbulent life as a teenager and young adult. By the age of 16, she was working as a secretary in New York City. She continued to write manuscripts, but had fallen out of favor with publishers, meaning her newer work never saw the light of day. In July of 1934, she married Nickerson Rogers. The pair had met in the summer of 1931 while traveling across Europe. At last, the young woman seemed fulfilled and happy, but this euphoria did not last long. Just a few years later, in 1937, Barbara began to express her dissatisfaction with the marriage. In 1938, she began to suspect Rogers of having an affair and became increasingly distressed by the notion. On December 7th of 1939, Barbara, now 25, left the home she shared with her husband in Massachusetts and was never seen or heard from again. According to Rogers, he and his wife argued and she left. 
She never came back and took with her $30, the modern day equivalent of about $558, and a single notebook. All of her documents, manuscripts, and other personal possessions were left behind. However, Rogers did not report her missing until two weeks later, claiming that he was waiting for her to return. It is possible that the couple had argued because Rogers had asked Barbara for a divorce, but we don't know this for certain. Four months later, Rogers asked the authorities to issue a missing person bulletin, but it was done under her married name, so the media did not pick up the case. Rogers also reportedly declined to publicize the case further, but this could have been due to Barbara's bad track record with the media. News outlets didn't actually pick up on her story until 1966. In 1941, Rogers reportedly attempted to divorce Barbara on the grounds of cruelty, but this was unsuccessful. However, he did eventually manage to get a divorce in 1944 and remarried shortly after. According to one of his daughters, Rogers hired a private investigator to help locate Barbara, but the investigator found no signs of the missing 25 year old. In 1952, Barbara's mother, Helen, pushed for more to be done in her daughter's case. She suspected Rogers of being involved and even wrote him a letter that said, quote, all of this silence on your part looks as if you had something to hide concerning Barbara's disappearance. She told him that she would do everything in her power to find out whether Barbara was dead or alive and where she was. Authorities never found a trace of Barbara after her disappearance. It has been theorized that she left to start a new life somewhere else. After all, she seemed to be an independent woman who loved adventure. It has also been speculated that she left to take her own life, given her history of depression. One Reddit user poignantly noted that Barbara may have seen her husband's distant cool behavior as an echo of her father's abandonment, which may have caused her great emotional distress. It's also been pointed out that her first love, Edward, passed away in 1937, and this may have added to the heartache. On November 25th, 1948, a hunter found human remains in Mount Prospect Woods, which overlooked Squam Lake in New Hampshire. Barbara was fond of the area and had stayed in a nearby farmhouse with Rogers several times. The remains were skeletal and some parts were missing, likely due to the weather and scavenging animals, but authorities were able to determine that they belonged to a woman in her mid twenties and that the skeleton had been there since at least 1939. For their part, law enforcement determined that the remains were those of a 25 year old pregnant woman named Elsie Whitmore who'd gone missing from Plymouth in 1936. However, there has been some speculation that the remains actually belong to Barbara due to the discrepancies between the skeleton and Elsie. The oddities are as follows. One, glasses were recovered from the scene, but Elsie did not wear glasses. Two, a size seven shoe was found along with the body, but Elsie wore a five or a 5.5. Three, no belongings from the scene could be identified by Elsie's family. It's also been noted that the Plymouth girl was in the later stages of pregnancy at the time of her vanishing, yet there was no indication in these remains that the body was of someone who was pregnant. And four, a water flask and a medicine bottle containing traces of barbiturates were found at the scene. As a result, investigators believed that Jane Doe had taken her own life. And wouldn't you know, Barbara was known to have been prescribed barbiturates for her disordered sleeping pattern. No death certificate for Elsie was ever released and her family never received the bones for burial. In fact, her family never really accepted the remains were hers. There is also no indication as to where the bones were buried or where they went. Their location to this day is unknown. Investigators closed their investigation roughly one week after the remains were found, satisfied with their conclusion that the body belonged to Elsie. 
There is much discussion online as to whether or not the bones belong to the 25 year old, but without the remains, Barbara's descendants cannot conduct DNA testing to confirm or debunk the notion. No trace of Barbara has ever been found in the years since her sudden disappearance, and there has never been any evidence to indicate or exclude foul play. To this very day, her vanishing remains a strange mystery. Marjorie West Perhaps one of Pennsylvania's most well-known cases is that of four-year-old Marjorie West. Marjorie was born to Shirley and Cecilia West on June 2nd of 1933 in Bradford, Pennsylvania. She had two siblings named Dorothea and Alan and was the youngest of the three. Her father, Shirley, was an assistant engineer at Kendall Refining. On the morning of May 8th, 1938, the West family attended church services in Bradford. Afterwards, they decided to go for a picnic to celebrate Mother's Day. They were accompanied by another couple, Mr. and Mrs. Ackerland, and drove about 13 miles along Highway 219 to Allegheny Forest, where they enjoyed the sunshine and relaxed. At around 3 p.m., Shirley, seven-year-old Alan, and Lloyd Ackerland went fishing in the nearby stream. Cecilia returned to the car for a rest, while Dorothea, 11 years old, along with Marjorie, collected flowers by the creek. At one point, Dorothea decided to present her mother with the flowers she picked, so she headed off. When she turned back, Marjorie was gone. The family, accompanied by their friends, attempted to search for the little girl, but found no sign of her, so they drove for seven miles until they found a bar. From here, they contacted the local police department. Upon arriving on the scene, authorities immediately suspected that the four-year-old had fallen into a well. There were many of them dotted around the area due to an oil boom in the 1870s. However, the wells were checked and the area, including the secluded forest, was thoroughly combed, yet it turned up no new leads. Scent dogs found nothing of interest and the search grew bigger involving 3,000 locals and 500 police officers. Witnesses came forward to law enforcement and reported seeing two cars drive past the site shortly before the time of Marjorie's vanishing, but the vehicles were traced and ruled out. Searchers eventually stumbled upon a fresh grave in the woods, but when they dug it up, they found only caskets of wine and a scrap of lace. The lace was at first thought to have belonged to the little girl, but her family described her as wearing a blue dress, a navy mid-length coat with the collar edged in pink, a red Shirley Temple style hat, and leather shoes. In other words, Marjorie wasn't wearing any lace when she vanished. Then a taxi driver came forward with a strange tale of his own. He told law enforcement that on the evening that Marjorie disappeared, he saw a girl resembling her in Thomas, West Virginia, the girl, who had the four-year-old's red curls and wore similar clothing, was crying. She was riding in a dark green sedan with an unidentified man in his late 30s. At around 11.38 p.m., the man stopped to ask the taxi driver where the nearest motel was located. The witness pointed out the nearest one, but the pair came back because the motel had no vacancies. Then the man asked for a local liquor store, the witness told him there was one down the road. Then, days later, a man who matched the description given by the taxi driver was seen by a gas station attendant as he refueled his car. The attendant noticed that in the back of the vehicle, there was a bundle wrapped in a gray blanket. At first, this seemed like a major break in the case. Authorities theorized that if Marjorie had been taken at around 3 p.m., it would have taken the perpetrator about eight hours to reach Thomas, so they would have arrived between 11 and 11.30 p.m., matching up with the witness statement. However, authorities were able to track the man down. He was the father of the little girl and was a merchant. The pair were trying to get home, but had to stop driving because of the thick fog that night. The little girl, who was either five or six, had been upset because she was frustrated at not being able to go home. 
Although the girl did look similar to Marjorie, police determined that the pair had nothing to do with the investigation, and she was not the missing four-year-old. However, it's unclear if the gas station attendant saw this same man or not. At one point, a 55-year-old woodsman who was never publicly identified was questioned in connection with the case. However, it was soon found that the man had nothing to do with the disappearance, and he was ultimately released from police custody. He has never been named as a suspect. Although there are very few clues in Marjorie's case, there are a lot of theories. As the four-year-old was out in the middle of a forest, it seems very likely that whatever happened to her was accidental. Online sleuths have suggested that perhaps she fell into the creek and was swept away by the water. Others have noted that she may have become prey to the wildlife or that she wandered off, got lost, and tragically succumbed to the elements. For a short period of time, there was some speculation that she had been taken to Canada by other family members. Another theory in Marjorie's case is that she became the victim of an illegal adoption ring. At the time, child abductors for profit were not uncommon. A woman in Tennessee named Georgia Tan was well known for her kindness and generosity. She operated a facility that placed at-risk children into adoptive homes. However, it later emerged that Georgia had actually been kidnapping children from poor families and selling them to the rich as a way of bypassing the entire proper adoption procedure and securing herself financial wealth. In 1998, a writer named Harold Thomas Beck began to look into the case, which he'd heard of during his days working as a barman. Using the internet, which was in its infancy at the time, Beck posted photos of Dorothea online and offered a $10,000 reward for anyone with information leading to Marjorie's whereabouts. Beck had posted the photos in the assumption that the sisters would look alike at their older age. Incredibly, Beck got a hit. A woman in Florida contacted him, saying she worked with a woman who was a nurse who resembled Dorothea. Beck then traveled to meet the woman, who even more surprisingly claimed to be Marjorie. The woman told him that on that day, in May of 1938, she had been hit by a car driven by a man who was driving past the forest while on his way to his farm in North Carolina. He'd been working temporarily at an oil refinery in Pennsylvania. After knocking down Marjorie, the man, who the woman referred to as her father, placed her in the back of his car to take her to the hospital. However, Marjorie awoke during the trip, and the man decided to take her back home to his grieving wife. The couple had lost their own daughter to an illness a short time before the accident. Reportedly, as she grew up, Marjorie still had memories from her former life, and would ask her parents about it, but they would always dismiss her. The woman swore Beck to secrecy, but said she wanted to meet Dorothea. Unfortunately, Dorothea had taken ill around this same time and was too unwell to meet the woman. Dorothea passed away in 2007, and DNA testing was never conducted. Beck revealed the woman's name following her death and ended up writing a book on the entire situation which several of Marjorie's descendants have dismissed as essentially a cash grab. In 2010, descendants of Marjorie's reached out to law enforcement, who started a new case file. Reportedly, the old one had been destroyed once the case reached the 75-year mark. The search for Marjorie West was the largest one undertaken by authorities since the Lindbergh baby kidnapping of 1932. Her case is the second oldest one in the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children's database, and yet it still remains unsolved. There has never been any trace of Marjorie in the years since her vanishing. If she is still alive, she will be 88 years old. If you have any information about her case, you can contact the Pennsylvania State Police at 814-938-0510. And then, Larisha and Wanda Walker. One of Nashville's most mysterious cold cases is that of Larisha Deanna Walker, who went by Deanna, and Wanda Walker, a mother and daughter who vanished 17 years apart, never to be seen or heard from again. 
On November 19th of 1999, 23-year-old mother of one, Deanna Walker, dropped her two-year-old son, Raven, off with her sister, Lakeisha Chambers. Lakeisha stayed in the 900 block of Gale Street and would be babysitting Raven that night. Deanna said that in the morning, she would drive her car to Murfreesboro, Tennessee, some 35 miles away to get a repair estimate for the car. Between 9.30 and 10 p.m., Deanna called her father and the pair chatted casually. Although it's clear that the 23-year-old arrived home safe that night, it is unknown what exactly her movements were outside of this phone call. Later that night, a neighbor reported that they'd heard Deanna arguing with someone outside of her home. After that, nobody heard from or saw her again. The next day, Deanna failed to pick up her son and didn't check in with the family and friends all day, and so Lakeisha went to visit her sister's home in the 3800 block of Edwards Avenue. Deanna had actually only been living there for about one month. The lights were on and there was music playing loudly. In a later interview with News Channel 5, Lakeisha said, everything looked in place. It looked as if two people had been sitting on the bed. So we feel whatever happened to her, it had to be someone she knew. Unsure of what to make of the situation, Lakeisha turned down the music and returned home. The following day, when the family continued to be met with silence, they called the police to report Deanna's vanishing. The clothes Deanna had been last seen in were found in her home, suggesting, as suspected, that she had gone home and gotten changed, and that something had happened later in the night, likely after her phone call with her father, and around the time the neighbor heard her yelling. Strangely, Deanna's car was missing from its parking spot at the back of the building, and has never been located. The maroon 1995 Oldsmobile had the Tennessee license plate 419ABG and a long distinctive scratch on the driver's side. There is some conflicting information about Deanna's employment at the time of her disappearance. Some sources, including the Charlie Project, have stated that she was working at the Peterbilt Motors Company in Nashville, a job she had found through a temporary agency. Others have noted that she was actually working in the fast food industry. Friends and family have described her as a responsible woman who was very private and very protective of her son. They do not believe that Deanna left her son behind willingly and noted that she hadn't talked about any issues she was having at work or with any ex-boyfriends or friends. Although it has never been clarified, it doesn't appear that Deanna was in communication with her son's father as, after she went missing, Raven was cared for by her family rather than his father's. Unfortunately, media coverage of Deanna's case quickly died out. Authorities have stated their belief that the 23-year-old was abducted from her home. Online sleuths have suggested that perhaps she was put into her own trunk by gunpoint or forced to drive somewhere, thus explaining why her car is still missing. Others have asked the question, why did Deanna want to drive 35 miles just to get a quote from a garage? There were plenty of garages in the area, yet she wanted to take the hour long round trip. Did she trust a specific worker or garage or was she going to Murfreesboro with other intentions? Her family noted that she was a private person. Perhaps she'd met a new friend or partner and wanted to meet them without explaining anything to her family. Many have wondered where Deanna's car went, but the possibilities on this road seem endless. It could have been taken apart in a chop shop, sold out of the state, given a fresh paint job and license plates, dumped in a body of water, or even abandoned somewhere and simply left to rot. In Deanna's case, there are far more questions and possibilities than there are answers and evidence. 17 years later, on October 5th of 2016, Deanna's mother, 60-year-old Wanda Faye Walker, was last seen by the family leaving the home she shared with her cousin in the 1400 block of 11th Avenue South. Wanda had a shift at the Dollar Tree store on Franklin Pike that day, but unfortunately on her way there, her car overheated and she broke down on the side of the road. Luckily, Wanda managed to contact her boyfriend, who came to help get her car up and running again. He met her and put oil in the car, and it started. 
However, after this, Wanda never arrived at work and was never seen or heard from again. One week later, on October 13th, Wanda's Nissan Maxima was found abandoned in an alley outside of a residence in the 1000 block of Wade Avenue. Locals told authorities that the vehicle had been sitting there for about a week, but that they hadn't seen Wanda. Her handbag was located in the car, along with law enforcement's most grisly discovery in this particular case. There was blood in the back seat. There is some conflicting information about how much blood was found. According to some sources, only trace amounts were present, but according to the Charlie Project, there was a significant amount, enough that it led authorities to believe that Wanda was likely dead already. Testing carried out on the blood proved that it belonged to the 60-year-old woman. According to Reddit user Blaze in the Dark, Wanda's boyfriend was actually a man with a violent history. Reportedly, he served time for attempting to kill one of his girlfriends in the early 2000s. There is very little reported about the man in most articles, and it is unclear as to whether or not he's ever been considered a serious suspect or person of interest by authorities. Most armchair detectives suspect that he was involved with her sudden disappearance. Many have speculated that the couple got into a row when he went to help her with her car, and she was killed in a fit of rage, or perhaps just knocked unconscious before her body was placed in the car, dumped somewhere, and the car was abandoned. However, this is all just speculation. There is very little in the way of physical evidence in this case. Authorities do not believe there is a connection between the disappearances of Larisha Deanna Walker and Wanda Walker. Deanna's son, Raven, told WKRN News about how his family had told him how much she loved and cared for him. He said, "'They said when she had me, I was all she really cared about. I was her everything.'" He also added, "'I just wanna have my granny back, and I wanna see my mama again. I just try to keep my head up." If Wanda is still alive, she will be 64 years old, and if Deanna is still alive, she will be 45. If you have any information about the disappearance of Wanda Walker or Deanna Walker, you can call the Nashville Metro PD at 615-862-8600, or alternatively, you can contact Crime Stoppers at 615-742-7463. Dorothy Distelhurst. Dorothy Ann Distelhurst was born on January 13th of 1928 to parents Alfred Edgar Distelhurst and his wife, Ruby Hamilton. The couple had another girl together, Martha Jane, and Alfred also had a son from a previous marriage named Alfred Jr. Dorothy was a member of the Belmont Methodist Church and enjoyed attending Sunday school. She was described as a popular, well-liked girl with many friends. The family were described as having a modest income. Alfred worked at a publishing house. As a result, they seemed like the least likely family to be targeted by ransomers. But that is exactly what happened in September of 1934. On September 19th, six-year-old Dorothy was making her way home from kindergarten. She was just three blocks between her school and her house in East Nashville, and she often made this trip alone with no problems. This day, however, was different. At home, her parents waited for their girl to come through the door, dressed in her blue and white plaid dress and clutching her pink lunch pail and school books. But this never happened. Dorothy never came home. Dorothy's parents were quick to raise the alarm. Local law enforcement launched an extensive search into the missing six-year-old, checking at the school and nearby parks for any sign of her. Friends and teachers hadn't seen her, there simply was no trace. It was as if she'd vanished into thin air. The media scrambled to get the word out about the sudden disappearance of this beloved little girl, but it only served to make the situation worse as Alfred and Ruby were suddenly flooded with ransom letters, all of which the police deemed to be false. One letter in particular chilled the parents. It demanded the equivalent of about $100,000 in exchange for the safe return of Dorothy. If they didn't comply, the letter writer said they'd burn Dorothy's eyes with acid. 
At one point, a man who demanded $5,000 was arrested and charged with extortion. The man didn't have Dorothy. In fact, he'd never set foot in Nashville. Alfred worked tirelessly to try and establish communication with the ransomer, even flying to his native New York to do so, but his efforts proved fruitless. He had been in the middle of one of these attempts when he received the worst news. On November 13th, just months following Dorothy's vanishing, her body was found by two hospital employees who were digging flower beds in a remote corner of the grounds of Davidson County Tuberculosis Hospital. They discovered the shallow grave and the unclothed body of a child beneath the dirt. Just 20 feet away, Dorothy's clothing, books, and lunchbox were found. Dental records confirmed this was the missing Dorothy. As her family grieved, the medical examiner got to work. Dorothy had suffered a crushed skull and her face had been burned with acid. This was possibly an attempt to obscure her identity. It was determined that a hammer was likely the murder weapon as she'd suffered multiple blows to the head. A rag was found stuffed in her mouth. The medical examiner also found that Dorothy's remains had possibly been stored in a cardboard box for several weeks before she was buried. There were no signs of sexual assault. One newspaper clipping from the time, which reported on the discovery, ends with the words, police believe the little girl was murdered by a friend. However, we have never found any clarification on this statement. Did authorities suspect a friend of the family or perhaps a babysitter? Did she have any older friends that were capable of delivering such blows? Once more, Dorothy's case is one with few answers, but infinite questions. Following the discovery of her body, federal agents and state investigators joined local law enforcement in a desperate hunt to find the perpetrator. Several people were questioned, but no one was ever charged with the crime. Reportedly, a week after Dorothy's body was recovered, a teenage boy found an iron spike 25 feet from where she'd been lying. Strands of hair were stuck to it, and it was possibly the murder weapon, although this was never established. There are many theories in Dorothy's case. Some online sleuths believe that the little girl was already dead when the ransomer wrote their letter. Others have suggested that maybe this was a case of mistaken identity. Perhaps Dorothy was thought to have been from a well-off family, someone who could easily pay a ransom. It's also been speculated that maybe the culprit was a teenager. Just four years after Dorothy's demise, a 12-year-old girl named Marianne Ellis was kidnapped and killed less than half a mile from the Distalhurst home. Three local teenagers were arrested and convicted for the tragic crime. According to one blog post on the case, a local private investigator believed Dorothy had been accidentally struck by a car and the driver had panicked and tried to cover it up. Meanwhile, authorities theorized that it was somebody local who knew the area well, given the odd choice of the burial location. Other than that, however, they appear to have come up with no motives and no clues. Dorothy's killer has never been identified. Dorothy was laid to rest at Woodlawn Cemetery on November 16th of 1934. However, her death wasn't the last time tragedy struck the family. Alfred Jr. was killed just nine years later during World War II. He was 26 years old. Ultimately, Alfred and Ruby retired to Virginia, where Alfred passed away in the 1970s. After this, Ruby returned to Tennessee, where she lived the rest of her days before passing away in 1985. And Mona Blades. Mona Elizabeth Blades was just 18 years old when she vanished while attempting to hitchhike from Hamilton, a city on the North Island of New Zealand. Her case is one of the country's longest running unsolved disappearances and was extensively covered by the media at the time in recent years, the case has been reopened by a cold case squad, but still, answers in her vanishing have remained elusive. On May 31st, 1975, the first day of the Queen's birthday long weekend, Mona intended on hitchhiking from her hometown of Hamilton to Hastings. She wanted to surprise her nephew for his birthday and bought him a set of colorful tumblers as a gift. At the time, Mona was living with her sister, Lillian, her brother-in-law, Tom, and her baby niece, Angela. 
In the morning, Tom dropped his sister-in-law off on Cambridge Road. This was the last time anyone in the family saw Mona. Since the trip was meant to be a surprise, nobody knew that Mona was coming to Hastings. As a result, it wasn't until three days later that the teenager was reported missing when she didn't return home as planned. While there isn't much recorded about the original investigation, what we do know is this. Authorities spent six months and 5,000 hours on the initial search and over 500 suspects were investigated. Despite the best efforts of law enforcement, not a single shred of evidence was found, which would indicate the fate of Mona Blades. What information they did receive, however, was an abundance of different sightings all across the town. The most notable of these witness sightings came from a truck driver who claimed to have seen Mona getting into an orange Datsun 120Y station wagon at around 10 o'clock that morning. Several other locals observed a similar vehicle heading off the highway and stopping on a rural street named Matia Road in Taupo. Another witness, a fencing contractor, saw the vehicle about 200 meters down the same road. He noticed that a woman matching Mona's description was sitting in the back while a white middle-aged man was in the driver's seat. When the witness passed the vehicle again a short time later, he saw that it was empty. This lead about the orange Datsun seemed like a huge break in the case and was treated as such. Investigators spent much of their time focusing on this tip-off, which may have been a detriment to the case. In 2018, the case was featured on television New Zealand's Cold Case Program, during which skilled detectives revisited all the case files in an attempt to find new leads. Those who re-examined the files believed that authorities had focused much too heavily on the Datsun, and as a result, had missed several other leads that may have proved valuable. They also believed that police may have misled witnesses by using an outdated picture of Mona. In the photo used by law enforcement, Mona had blonde curls, but at the time of her disappearance, she was sporting a mullet hairstyle. Not only this, but it was concluded that Mona had spent longer in the town of Taupo than originally thought, and perhaps never left it alive. And it was also discovered that the truck driver who'd reported the orange Datsun sighting changed his story on multiple occasions, suggesting that he was influenced by what he heard or read about the case. Several witness sightings were ignored in favor of the orange Datsun lead. One shop worker who knew Mona personally claimed that they saw her getting into a darkish blue-green station wagon, which drove off in the direction of the Napier Taupo Highway. The witness claimed the 18-year-old was with another female hitchhiker who joined her in the car. Another sighting came from someone who'd spoken with a woman who'd identified herself as Mona Blades. The woman was seen in the early afternoon hours of May 31st at the Spa Hotel in Taupo. Afterwards, she was observed getting into a red Toyota station wagon. While the cold case team believed that Mona met with people she knew in Taupo and left with them, other detectives have suggested that she was perhaps abducted and killed by members of a gang who were traveling to Wellington that weekend. Reportedly, the 18-year-old was friends with several people who were part of a notorious biker gang named Highway 61. To add to this, in 2018, a man who wished to remain anonymous approached the Rotura Daily Post and claimed that a friend, who died in 2013, told him that Highway 61 were involved with Mona's vanishing. The gang members reportedly spoke about the abduction a year later and said they had killed her afterwards. Apparently, a red Toyota was traveling with the gang and observers saw two people carrying a rolled up piece of carpet to the back of the vehicle. It's unclear if this is the same car that was seen by the witness who had seen Mona at the spa hotel. The biker gang are not the only suspect in the case, however. A man named John Freeman was investigated shortly after the inquiry began, when authorities discovered that he'd rented an orange Datsun on the weekend of the incident. Two weeks later, when police announced publicly they were looking for an orange Datsun, Freeman shot and wounded a university student before pulling the trigger on himself. It's unknown if Freeman was in any way involved with Mona's vanishing. 
Another man who was investigated is a man named Charlie Hughes from Hamilton, who has been interviewed three times since the 1970s and has given a DNA sample. He has maintained his innocence throughout the decades and has publicly expressed his frustration about being considered a suspect. In 2004, investigators were told about an alleged shallow grave bearing Mona's name in the garage of a home in Huntley. The name had been inscribed on concrete six years earlier and was reportedly supposed to be a joke. The former homeowner later apologized to the Blades family. In 2012, police dug up the concrete floor of a house in Kawerau, which had once belonged to a traffic officer who died in 2009. The officer had been accused by a fellow policeman of abducting and killing Mona. The accuser, Tony Muller, claims that he had his suspicions for a long time. He apparently sent the authorities a compilation of information in 2011. A year later, authorities turned up at the house to search beneath the floor of the laundry room. Muller was convinced there was a body beneath the concrete and witnessed law enforcement's drill 80 centimeters and then probe a further 80. However, nothing of interest was found beneath the floor. Despite this, Muller is convinced there is a body buried in the house, although he now believes it's buried beneath the stairwell. According to a New Zealand Herald article from 2012, the homeowners also believe this to be true, but authorities are unable to excavate without evidence. Despite the case being reopened and the new investigation beginning in 2018, Mona's case remains unsolved. Kirsty Bentley. Born in Christchurch on January 18th of 1983 to Sid and Jill Bentley, Kirsty Bentley was described as an honest, vibrant, and compassionate girl by her mother. She was, by all accounts, an ordinary teenager who loved the Backstreet Boys, her new boyfriend Graham, and hanging out with her friends. She had a strong creative flair and was well liked by her classmates at Ashburton College. Her brutal murder in 1998 left locals in shock and disbelief and authorities baffled. Her unsolved case is one of New Zealand's biggest and most enduring mysteries. On December 31st of 1998, 15 year old Kirsty spent the morning shopping with one of her best friends, Leanne, in their hometown of Ashburton. The pair had lunch at McDonald's around midday and later stopped in at a KFC for a drink. Kirsty was returned home by Leanne's sister at around 2.30 p.m. Upon entering her house, Kirsty was greeted by her 19 year old brother, John. The pair got along well and John told his sister that she had missed a call from her boyfriend who asked her to call back. According to phone records, Kirsty called Graham at around 2.38 p.m but was met with his answer service. She left him a message asking him to get in touch and then decided to take the family dog, Abby, out for a walk. According to her family, this was normal for Kirsty. The 15 year old enjoyed taking Abby out for a walk to pass the time. John has mentioned in recent interviews that he doesn't remember Kirsty saying goodbye, but he remembers hearing the front gate closing. Shortly thereafter at 3.05 PM, a neighbor saw Kirsty walking past their house with Abby in tow. Meanwhile, Graham called the Bentley residence at around 4.30 PM, only to find that his girlfriend was out once again. It was at this point that John realized his sister still wasn't home. He noted that her usual route did not take her away from the house for such a long period of time. When the pair's mother, Jill, returned from work at around 5.15 PM, she checked with Graham to make sure Kirsty hadn't gone over there. When he confirmed that she hadn't, the mother of two headed out to search for her 15-year-old daughter, taking her usual dog walking route along the Ashburton River. Growing more anxious, Jill eventually returned home. Back at the house, Jill and John decided to wait until 6 p.m. before searching again. They thought she might turn up while they waited. While John headed out to look for his little sister, her father, Sid, returned home. At 6.20 p.m., Sid, called the police. Both the local community and law enforcement came together to help the Bentley family search for the 15 year old. They spent the whole night looking for Kirsty or any evidence that might indicate where she was, but came away empty handed. 
The next morning, the official search and rescue began. At 10 a.m., the dog, Abby, was found tied to a tree near the river. This same area had been searched the night before, but it's possible she was missed due to the thick foliage nearby. Just minutes later, searchers uncovered a pair of underwear and a pair of boxers that were later confirmed as belonging to Kirsty. They were not torn and did not look as if they'd been forcibly removed, although it is a tragic possibility they were removed after her potential death. Over the next 16 days, the Ashburton area was heavily searched. Troops from the Burnham military camp were even sent to aid the manhunt. On January 17th, 1999, just one day before what would have been Kirsty's 16th birthday, her body was found by two men in the Camp Gully area of Rakaia, about 40 kilometers or nearly 25 miles away from Ashburton. Due to the summer heat, her remains were in an advanced state of decomposition and her body had to be formally identified via dental records. The body had been placed in the fetal position in a patch of overgrown scrub and Kirsty's black tank top and blue sarong were still on her body. She had been wearing both the last time she was seen. Her remains had been covered in a layer of branches and leaves. An extensive examination of the scene began and continued over the next several days. Law enforcement took plaster casts of the tire tracks in the area and eventually appealed for information from the public, requesting that anyone who saw any vehicles in the area at the time come forward. They also asked for any cannabis growers to come forward if they had seen anything strange. The area in which Kirsty's body was found was known to be used by cannabis growers. Kirsty had suffered blunt force trauma to the right side of the back of her head, which had fractured her skull. The coroner believed that she'd have died shortly after being struck. Due to the state of decomposition, it could not be determined whether or not Kirsty was sexually assaulted, but there appeared to be no signs of a struggle and her top and sarong were unmoved and intact. Authorities believe that the body was placed in the Camp Gully area on the night she was slain. Over the two decades since Kirsty's demise, there have been hundreds of suspects, many of whom have not been formally eliminated from the inquiry. Soon after the investigation was launched into the murder, the media reported that both John and Sid Bentley were considered suspects, which authorities later confirmed. Both denied being involved. An examination carried out at the family's home, which included luminol testing, gave the police nothing of any value. However, Kirsty's father, Sid, who was noted by authorities to be an alcoholic, was unable to provide law enforcement with a solid alibi. At first, he claimed that he'd been in Christchurch and Littleton at the time his daughter disappeared, but he later claimed that he'd hit his head on a cupboard door and had forgotten he'd been in Ashburton for part of the day. Even today, Sid's exact whereabouts at the time of Kirsty's vanishing are unknown. Many members of the family, including his ex-wife Jill, believed he was too embarrassed to admit whatever it was he was doing, but that he wasn't involved with the abduction of his daughter or her subsequent murder. Many online sleuths have stated their belief that Sid was in some way, shape or form involved with his daughter's demise. According to reports, he doted on Kirsty as a child, but their relationship became difficult as she entered her teens. Another peculiar detail about Sid is that there were several witnesses who claimed to have seen the father of two at a hotel at around 4 p.m. on the day she vanished. This has led forum users to suggest that perhaps he was cheating on his wife or was involved in a relationship with another man. Sid is often described as a stoic and prideful Englishman, leading many to think he must have been doing something that he thought was extremely damaging to his reputation or embarrassing to have hidden it from investigators. All the way up until his death in 2015, Sid believed that his whereabouts had nothing to do with anyone else because he knew he did not take the life of his own child and that was enough. Another reason some believe Sid was involved was that Abby had been carefully tied up to a tree. Amateur sleuths have wondered why a cold-blooded killer would tie Abby up instead of killing her too. This has led to the theory that whoever took Kirsty was somebody close enough to the family that they didn't want to hurt their dog. A retired investigator who was asked to look at the case agreed with this idea. 
He said the perpetrator was likely somebody close to Kirsty, based on the nature of the crime and the way her body was left. However, others have suggested the idea that Sid had helped John cover up the crime, or that Sid was not involved, but somehow knew more than he was letting on, and that perhaps he even knew the name of his daughter's killer. However, these notions are just speculation and have no evidence to back them up. Another line of inquiry followed by investigators was that of a distinct green comma van with the registration plate EP9888. The vehicle was described as being a 1961 model set up to be used as a camper. It had the distinctive comma badge on the front and was either blue or a faded blue green. It had been last registered with the New Zealand Transport Agency in 1995. The van was extremely rare, and as few as two matching its description were believed to have ever been in New Zealand. While lots of people came forward with information, most were incorrect about the vehicles they'd seen being comma vans. It was easy for the police to rule them out, since the vehicle was so unique. An experienced mechanic who caught wind of this request came forward to tell police that he'd seen a similar vehicle around the time of Kirsty's vanishing. Due to his job and the rarity of the vehicle, the witness was able to describe the van in great detail. There were several reports of the van being seen in Ashburton and Camp Gully in the weeks before the 15-year-old's body was found. However, no further leads were ever discovered, and the exact van was never located. Aside from looking for the van, authorities also distributed flyers asking for information about a girl seen near the vehicle on Chalmers Avenue, close to where Kirsty vanished. The girl was known to dairy owners in the suburb of Netherby as a customer, but she never came forward. Her identity and connection with the van remain unknown to this day. Other suspects in Kirsty's case include a man who committed a double homicide in 2014, and an unidentified man who was considered a suspect from the start of the investigation. Russell John Tully executed two staff members at the Ashburton Work and Income Office in 2014. Reportedly, he was known to camp around the Ashburton River area around the time Kirsty vanished. However, he has since been ruled out of the investigation as he was able to prove that he was in Nelson at the time of the 15-year-old's disappearance, a place which is 251 miles from Ashburton. After Sid's death in 2015, an unidentified woman came forward to tell police that she suspected her ex-boyfriend of being involved with Kirsty's demise. Reportedly, this man had been interviewed at the beginning of the investigation and denied involvement, but his ex-girlfriend claimed that he had admitted to her several times while drunk that he had committed the heinous crime. The ex-girlfriend was interviewed along with the suspect originally. She said that at the time, they had only just started dating and she had no reason to doubt him. Over time, however, she realized that he knew more than what was made available to the public. However, the detective inspector in charge of the case, Greg Merton, has said that the man had already been investigated and he would not comment on the woman's allegations. In 2018, the underwear found near Abby and the leash she was tied up with were both sent for DNA testing along with several other items. However, the results failed to bring any new information to the table. Kirsty's funeral was held at St. Stephen's Anglican Church in Ashburton on January 25th, 1999. It was attended by over 500 mourners. Kirsty's body was cremated and her ashes sealed in a steel urn, which was buried in a specially planted memorial garden at the family home. After Sid's death in 2015, the urn was transferred to Jill. In 2018, Authorities announced that John and Sid Bentley were no longer considered suspects in the case, a relief to John, who now lives in Australia. Sid and Jill divorced in 2000, although surprisingly, not because of the media circus that surrounded them, or even their grief over the loss of their daughter, but because Jill had, quote, grown to dislike the alcoholic I was living with. The split affected John's relationship with his father, who began to spread rumors about Jill's new partner. The pair fell out when John confronted Sid about his behavior. Jill remarried in 2008 to Noel Peachley. 
The pair live a quiet, reclusive life with their rescue cat Tara and Kirsty's collection of plush toys, whom Noel refers to affectionately as the boys. Jill still maintains a good relationship with John. Kirsty's childhood friend, Leanne, who was with her on the morning of December 31st, has claimed that she has her own suspicions about what happened that day, although she does not elaborate in any of her interviews. As of 2018, Kirsty's case is still open and active, yet remains unsolved. If you have any information pertaining to either case we've covered in today's episode, please contact New Zealand Crime Stoppers on 0800 555 111. Khadija Britton. Born April 22nd of 1994, Khadija Rose Britton was described by her loved ones as a bright and athletic teenager who was sure to go far in life. A member of the Round Valley Indian tribes of the Round Valley Reservation, Khadija grew up in Covalo, California and was an accomplished student who was also the star of her high school basketball team. Her friends and classmates noted that she was popular and confident with a strong sense of humor. Everyone was certain that as a young woman, she would break away from her hometown and go to college. But Khadija had that opportunity robbed of her in the early months of 2018. It was the night of February 7th, 2018 that Khadija was last seen alive. Three days passed before her family filed a missing person report after hearing nothing from her. It's not that her family were unconcerned, it was more that in the last few years, Khadija had begun to live an increasingly unpredictable lifestyle. Instead of leaving to go to community college after graduating high school in 2012, she began to fall in with the wrong crowd. It wasn't long before she'd become involved in abusing drugs. Her community was known to be suffering from both drug and alcohol issues. Through her substance abuse, Khadija got to know a man named Niji Tony Fallis IV, who was around 14 years her senior. Although she didn't know it right away, Fallis was bad news. He'd had far more than his fair share of brushes with the law and had been charged with numerous offenses, ranging from manufacturing meth to endangering the health of a child to domestic violence. He'd even had his children taken from his custody after keeping them in filthy, squalid conditions. However, he appeared to father more children after his stint in prison in San Joaquin County, because shortly after he met Khadija, she was in charge of his children. She would do their laundry, cook their meals, and collect them from school. While friends and family were unimpressed by Khadija's choice of boyfriends, their complaints and concerns fell on deaf ears. On January 30th, 2018, a hysterical, bleeding, and bruised Khadija turned up on the doorstep of the house belonging to her father, stepmother, and their children. She told the couple about how Phallus had beaten her with his fists before picking up a hammer. The next day, working with the tribe's domestic violence center, Khadija filed a restraining order against her boyfriend. She was also given money to replace the possessions she'd left behind at his home, including her clothes and phone. Ultimately, however, Phallus managed to dissuade, or force, the 23-year-old not to follow through with the charges against him. This is thought to have been because, given his criminal history, Phallus would have spent considerable time in jail had the charges been successful. However, that was not the end. After Khadija was reported missing on February 10th, 2018, a witness came forward to police with a horrific story. On the night of her disappearance, Khadija was known to have been visiting a friend in the 23,000 block of Airport Road. The witness claimed that around midnight, Phallis, accompanied by his new girlfriend, a woman named Antonia, turned up at the house in a black Mercedes. Armed with a small pistol, Phallis went to the door of the house and demanded that Khadija come out and speak with him. After this, a physical altercation ensued, and Phallus began to chase his ex-girlfriend around the car, which was being driven by Antonia. Phallus managed to hit Khadija and shove her into the car, and the three drove off together. The 23-year-old was never seen since. 10 days later, in mid-February, Phallus was charged with multiple offenses in connection with the disappearance of Khadija, including assault, kidnapping, first-degree burglary, threats to commit a crime resulting in death or great bodily injury, attempted murder, 
and for being a felon in possession of a firearm and ammunition. However, Fallis pled not guilty and refused to cooperate with detectives who were investigating the vanishing of his ex-girlfriend. Several months later in June of 2018, the police were forced to drop most of the charges due to a lack of evidence. Fallis' bail was reduced and he was released shortly afterwards, although he still faced the gun and ammunition possession charges. In August, Antonia was arrested for suspicion of harboring or concealing a wanted felon. A few months later in October, Fallis pled no contest to the firearm charges, while his girlfriend pled no contest to being an accessory to a felony. Fallis, who was 37 at the time, was sentenced to four years in prison, while Antonia was sentenced to 18 months in prison and 18 months under supervision. She was also ordered to have no further contact with her boyfriend and was forced to spend six months in an inpatient drug rehabilitation program. Both detectives and Khadija's family believe that Fallis kills the 23-year-old on the night she was taken. The problem is they're unable to prove it without first finding her body. During the investigation, authorities questioned and arrested many of Fallis's associates. They also set up an anonymous tip line and missing persons posters were plastered all across the surrounding counties. Meanwhile, friends and family did their best to raise awareness for Khadija's case on social media, including setting up a Facebook group. In 2019, a pond in Mendocino County was drained when cadaver dogs indicated that something was buried there. However, no human remains were found. Lieutenant Shannon Barney of the Mendocino County Sheriff's Office, who was also a member of the reservation, said in a 2018 article that he believed somebody knew what happened and where Khadija was, but they were keeping quiet, telling the press Democrats, quote, throughout the ages, tribal people have closed down among their own, within their own little tribal system for protection. That's part of the culture. We know there are people who know more than they're telling us, but we have not been able to break through that tribalism. In 2018, a $50,000 reward was made available. That reward was doubled in 2020 with the help of the FBI, who have been assisting in the investigation. Khadija's family continue to look for answers. In March of 2018, her father, Jerry, and one of her brothers searched for her in the snowy landscape of the Mendocino National Forest after receiving a tip. When their SUV got stuck, the pair continued on foot, but their efforts proved fruitless. Abandoned buildings and chicken coops have been investigated by Jerry, who takes a shovel when he goes out with him, so he can check out any shallow graves. Although the perpetrator in this case seems obvious, the family have still not received closure or justice. Khadija's body has still not been recovered, and it's likely that, without it, Fallis will not be charged. The case is still open and active. If you have any information on the location of Khadija, or her remains, you can contact the Mendocino Sheriff's Office tip line on 707-234-2100. Kiera Coles. Born September 24th, 1992 to Joseph Coles and Karen Phillips, Kiera was the fourth of five children and appeared to have a relatively normal upbringing. As an adult, she was close to her mother the pair spoke on a near daily basis, and she was also very anxious to start her own family. Kiera often told her family and friends that as soon as she was financially stable, she wanted to have her first child. Shortly before her vanishing, she was on her way to having her perfect life. She had moved out to her own apartment on the south side of Chicago, Illinois, and she had purchased a new car. She had also recently found out that she was pregnant, her baby was due in April of 2019. 26-year-old Kiera was working for the USPS at the time of her disappearance. According to some reports, she'd been there since 2017, while other sources claim she'd been there about three years. According to her mother, Karen, Kiera had taken the 1st and 2nd of October 2018 off from work for personal reasons. She was due back on the 3rd. However, the 26-year-old never showed up to her shift Instead, she called in sick. Between the 3rd and the 4th of October, Karen continued to call her daughter, who wasn't answering her phone. The calls were going straight to voicemail, leading Karen to believe that Kiera's phone must have been out of battery. 
She then asked Kiera's sibling to check her social media. Kiera hadn't posted there either. Beginning to grow concerned, Karen asked the Chicago Police Department to perform a welfare check on her daughter. Kiera's car was still parked outside her apartment block, but the young woman herself was missing. Initially, police didn't think much of Kiera's vanishing, believing it to be a non-suspicious case, but eventually they began to suspect foul play. Karen had last seen her daughter on the Sunday before she vanished, September 30th. The pair had spoken about Kiera's preparation for the baby and what milk was best to drink while she was pregnant. However, the case grew a little complicated when the 26-year-old sister claimed that she had last seen her on Monday the 1st after picking her up from work. This statement conflicted with Karen's testimony that her daughter had taken Monday the 1st and Tuesday the 2nd off from work. This information has never been fully clarified in subsequent reports on the disappearance. Upon investigating further, the case grew all the more complex when authorities found out that the father of Kiera's baby, Joshua Simmons, whom she'd been seeing for five years, actually already had a long-term girlfriend and several children. There are also some reports that he had a third girlfriend, although this is only mentioned in a few articles. Not only was Kiera pregnant, but Simmons' long-term girlfriend was also pregnant with their third child. Reportedly, both Kiera and the other girlfriend knew of one another. According to Karen, the pair did not get on, and Kiera had been banned from visiting Simmons at his house. It is unclear if the authorities ever spoke with Simmons. In early 2019, he was wanted for questioning in relation to Kiera's case. Reportedly, after the 26-year-old vanished, Simmons, his girlfriend, and their children moved out of state. They never participated in any searches for Kiera, nor any vigils. NBC5 found Simmons living in Louisiana in 2021, but he failed to reply to any of their letters. Following her disappearance, investigators found CCTV footage from a neighbor's surveillance camera, which showed a woman resembling Kiera walking toward her car on the morning of October 3rd. The woman was possibly wearing a postal worker uniform, although this has been heavily debated. The woman appeared to spot something out of frame and walk towards it. She didn't appear fearful or hesitant as she passed by Kiera's car and disappeared from view. Her movements led some to speculate that she had seen someone she knew or a car she recognized and walked towards it. Over the years, this footage has been subject to much scrutiny. At first, the Coles believed that this was their missing loved one. Over time, however, they have changed their minds. Most notably, Karen came forward earlier this year to tell the media that she never believed the woman was Kiera, but that authorities had asked her to keep quiet about her suspicions. Karen explained that the woman's gait and the shape of her body did not match that of her daughter. She also added that she was only revealing this information now because the investigation had stalled and she felt she had nothing to lose. The USPS, for their part, also does not believe that the woman in the footage is Kiera, but another postal worker who was on that route that day. In February of 2021, Karen also revealed that another neighbor had come forward with CCTV footage from the night of October 2nd. The video showed Kiera and Simmons leaving her apartment in separate vehicles. Investigators told the media that they had also recovered surveillance images of the 26-year-old withdrawing $400 from her bank account before handing it over to Simmons. It's unclear if Kiera's bank account has been used in the years since she vanished. After Kiera disappeared, her phone, bag, and lunchbox were recovered from her car. Meanwhile, her keys and purse were found in her apartment. Online sleuths have noted that the lunchbox being found in the car was odd, given that she had supposedly called in sick. This phone call has been a controversial part of the case online. Many armchair detectives have suggested that perhaps someone called in sick, pretending to be the 26-year-old. Her family have been unable to confirm if the phone call was in her call log, as they have been unable to access her phone without her passcode. It's unknown why authorities haven't looked into this. The USPS worker who took Kiera's call is adamant that it was her. Authorities also searched Whistler Woods Forest Preserve in Riverdale after following some anonymous tips they'd received. While a few bones were discovered at the scene, it's unknown if they were animal or human. Many areas in and around Chicago were searched, but all to no avail. 
A reward of $50,000 was also set up, although it has yet to be claimed. Kiera's family are desperate to bring her home and hopefully meet her baby. Her father, Joseph, quit his job in Wisconsin and moved to Chicago following the disappearance. He has spoken frequently about the case online and to the media and has handed out flyers on the street. For a period of time, he lived in his car outside of Kiera's apartment block, determined to find answers. The 26-year-old's friends and co-workers also continue to tirelessly spread awareness of her case. Even today, Joseph continues to hold meetings to spread awareness about his daughter's disappearance. In 2020, he said that he believed Kiera was alive, but being held captive in a vacant home. He added that he believed authorities had not done enough to help bring her back. In July of 2020, law enforcement announced that the investigation was suspended because they'd exhausted all leads. They have stated that they still suspect Kiera met with foul play, but have otherwise been tight-lipped. They told the media that they are looking for evidence to back up their theory and that they believe two or three people were involved with the 26-year-old's disappearance. In September of 2020, the Chicago Police Department told the Chicago Tribune that they were working with the US Postal Inspection Service and the FBI to continue the search. They also noted that the case was not closed and they'd be investigating any new evidence or tips they received. Although there isn't much in the way of evidence in Kiera's case, there is a lot of speculation online. The most common theory is that Joshua Simmons was involved in Kiera's disappearance, with some even suggesting that his girlfriend was also involved. Amateur sleuths came to this conclusion after noting the way the couple left Illinois in the aftermath of the vanishing, and that neither helped with the investigation or the search. Some have theorized that it was done out of jealousy, but others have proposed that neither half of the couple wanted anything to do with Kiera's baby, and so they sought to rid themselves of the problem. Karen has said that while she initially didn't believe that Simmons was capable of harming her daughter, his silence has caused her to think otherwise. Another theory that has been proposed in Kiera's case is that she left to start over, overwhelmed by all the changes in her life. However, her family don't believe that she would abandon everything she had worked for, and they don't believe she wouldn't at least let them know she was okay. Others have speculated that Kiera was simply a victim of a local gang, or was the target of a crime of opportunity. While Kiera's case is still open, the investigation has slowed down considerably in the last year. If you have any information about the disappearance, you can contact the Area South Division of the Chicago PD on 312-747-8274. Louise Borglet. One of Denmark's most heartbreaking cases is that of Louise Borglet. In late 2016, Louise was 32 years old and seven months pregnant with her first child. She was not in a relationship with the baby's father and had chosen to move from Copenhagen to Herlu when she discovered that she was pregnant. Here, Louise shared an apartment with her sister, Suzanne, her brother-in-law, Martin, their two children, and their dog an eight-year-old golden retriever named Maggie. A beauty advisor at a high-end department store, Louise was voted best colleague by her co-workers in 2015. Loved ones described her as fun, easygoing, happy, and humble. She affectionately referred to her unborn baby, who she found out was to be a boy, as Little P. Very little is publicly known about the baby's father, adding another layer of mystery to Louise's strange case. At around 6.30 p.m. on the evening of Friday, November 4th, 2016, a heavily pregnant Louise ventured out in the rain and cold to walk Maggie. Before leaving the family home, she pulled on her brother-in-law's olive green rain clothing, consisting of trousers and a hooded jacket, as well as his blue rubber boots. She said goodbye to her sister and headed five minutes down the road to the local dog park, where she and Maggie walked in peace, enjoying the cool night air. At around 7.10 p.m., a couple out walking their own dog were surprised to see Maggie bounding toward them, her leash dragging in the wet grass behind her. The pair felt that the canine wanted to show them something, so they followed her 
to the body of Louise. She looked still and pale in the darkness, and according to several Danish media outlets, she was lying, quote, like a cross, her arms outstretched at either side. When the couple reached for Louise, they realized her body was limp. The man, Michael, a 52-year-old tire fitter, immediately started performing CPR, while his partner dialed the number for emergency services. Just minutes after the paramedics arrived on the scene, Louise was sadly pronounced dead. She had suffered a puncture wound to one of her breasts and another to her ribcage. In the immediate aftermath of the crime, authorities propped up a tent over the crime scene and began to collect tracks in the wet grass. Maggie was also examined and her fur was tested for any trace of DNA evidence. Law enforcement combed through several lakes in the area, searching for the murder weapon, which is believed to be a knife, but their efforts proved fruitless. Soon, witnesses began to come forward. At around 7 p.m., witnesses heard two screams coming from the park. One was short, one was long. The same witness then nearly collided with a man fleeing the park. Upon seeing them, the man threw his hands up in the air, possibly in despair or frustration, before turning around and heading back into the park. The man was described as being between the ages of 28 and 30, five foot 10 inches of a thin build with a thin, defined face, which some publications have described as marked, although it's unclear what exactly this means. Another unclear detail about the man is he reportedly had, and I quote, golden skin. This means he could be tanned, have an olive complexion, or perhaps his skin just appeared yellow tinged beneath the street lamps. The man was wearing a black jacket with the hood up and a black cap underneath, dark trousers and a leisure sweatshirt. One year after the crime, authorities released CCTV footage that featured the man. Unfortunately, the video is blurry, dark and brief, and the footage is from quite a distance making it difficult to tell anything really about the possible suspect. A month later, in December, a red bike found near the scene of the crime with a black baby seat attached was thought to possibly be connected to the crime. Authorities appealed to the public, asking whoever the owner was to come forward. They did, but it turned out that the bike had been stolen sometime before Louise's demise, but the owner did not report it as missing because she didn't have insurance. Once more, police were back at square one. As Louise was a well-liked woman with no known enemies, authorities eventually realized she was the victim of a random act of violence. They believed a mentally disturbed individual attacked her for no reason, other than that she was in the wrong place at the wrong time. There were simply no other motives they could find or suspects in her personal life. They have also, however, not ruled out any other theories just yet. It does not appear that Louise's autopsy results were ever made public. In 2018, a peer review began, which involved expert police investigators from other districts taking a look at the case. Authorities announced that they were retracing all of their steps, and they even took eight highly trained sniffer dogs back to the park to see if they could turn up new evidence or leads. In December that year, a knife was found in a stream less than a mile from the crime scene. At that time, it was believed to be the murder weapon, although so far, it's unclear if this was ever actually confirmed. While there isn't a huge amount of information available in Louise's case, online sleuths have an abundance of theories and questions. Many have asked whether it's possible that Louise was mistaken for somebody else, possibly her brother-in-law, since she was wearing his rain clothing. Others, however, have argued it's unlikely someone would memorize someone else's clothing and that green rainwear is hardly unique. It's also been suggested that perhaps Louise quietly went to meet someone at the park without letting anyone else know. Others have speculated that maybe her case is linked with that of 17-year-old Emily Meng. She went missing just four months prior. Her body was found in December of 2016, and her murder is still unsolved. Other theories in Louise's case suggest that it was a robbery gone wrong or that the baby's father is involved. To this day, little is known about the father, 
According to one report, not even Louise's sister was aware of his identity. It seemed that neither party wanted him to be involved with the baby's upbringing. Tragically, Louise's case is still unsolved. If it really was a random act of violence, then it's unlikely we will ever see the perpetrator brought to justice unless they confess or fresh evidence is uncovered. Marie Locke Hansen. Born on June 13th of 1924, Marie Rode Madsen did not have the easiest time growing up. Her family had lived in poverty for generations, and she grew up in a rural farming area in the village of Lisbjerg, located in the second biggest city of Denmark called Aarhus. She was one of six children, but two of her brothers died at a young age. One of her sisters reportedly passed away on Christmas Eve of 1931, while another followed 13 years later. Her father also died when she was just seven years old. Clever and determined, Marie sought to achieve more than the life her parents and siblings lived. She was the first one in her family to take the exam in high school, which would allow her to enter university. As a young adult, Marie worked a handful of different jobs, including a proofreader, telephone operator, and office assistant. In the early 1940s, she met her first husband. The couple married in 1946, but later split up, ultimately divorcing in 1952. Between 1949 and 1950, Marie was employed by an engineering company to serve as a secretary to one of the owners, a man named Oscar Locke Hansen who also worked as a teacher at an engineering school and was 10 years her senior. It wasn't long before the couple grew interested in one another romantically. They married in 1953. In the early 60s, the couple moved to the suburb of Hoibilla with Oscar's adopted daughter, Lisbeth. Around this same time, Oscar sold his share of his engineering company and began teaching full time. Together, the pair lived a more than comfortable life. Marie became a housewife who spent most of her time cleaning and cooking, but for something to do while Oscar was working, she began running a photocopying business from the basement of their villa. Her husband and his colleagues were her main customers, but she occasionally took on business from strangers too. On the morning of November 10th, 1967, Oscar left for work at around 9 a.m. Shortly afterwards, Marie enlisted the help of her neighbor, a woman named Lizzie Christensen, as she was running behind with her workload. At 10 a.m., the couple's maid, Irma Rasmussen, arrived at the home. She worked part-time for the pair, assisting Marie in the day-to-day -day chores of cleaning and tidying. Marie and Irma had their own routine, where they'd clean for just shy of an hour before stopping for a coffee break. November 10th, was no different. The two women invited Lizzie to join them at 10.50 a.m., but she refused, opting to continue working instead. Just as Marie and Irma sat down, the door went. Irma listened as Marie answered the door, hearing her employer say something along the lines of, quote, make it quick. Marie told the customer she was busy, but could fit them in if their exchange was brief. Irma watched as a man followed Marie into her office. They closed the door behind them. Just moments later, however, things took a turn when Marie cried out, oh no, before beginning to scream and gunshots rang out. Irma ran to Marie's aid, but came face to face with the killer who drew his gun from his pocket and fired once into her abdomen. Irma fell to the floor and the man told her to stay calm before he left. Lizzie, startled by the noises coming from upstairs, shouted up to the other women, asking what was going on. Irma replied that she and Marie had been shot. Acting quickly, Lizzie ran out the basement door to a neighbor's house so that she could call for help. On her way there, she reportedly saw a man calmly walking past on the street. This man is widely believed to have been the killer. Meanwhile, Irma crawled to the front door and made it to the front of the villa where she screamed for help. A nearby gardener rushed to the aid of the victims. Inside the house, he found the body of Marie. She had been shot three times. 
Irma, however, was much luckier. She survived her single gunshot wound and spent the next several decades of her life attempting to bring Marie's killer to justice. She reportedly had a photographic memory and was dubbed by authorities as one of the best witnesses they'd ever worked with. During her remaining lifetime, she looked at hundreds, if not thousands of photographs, giving law enforcement detailed reasons as to why the man in the photo was not the man who had shot her and Marie on that devastating day. Irma described the man to authorities as being between the ages of 35 and 40, wearing a dark blue or black coat, a hat and glasses, and carrying a briefcase. The description of this man matches the description of the one seen by Lizzie when she ran for help. Using this description, authorities had a newspaper cartoonist make a composite sketch of the man. However, Irma didn't think the man resembled the culprit well enough, and so the drawing was never made public until 2006. Shortly after arriving on the scene, authorities put up roadblocks and took a team of sniffer dogs into the woods behind the couple's house. A man in a blue coat who was sitting in his car on a road in the forest was arrested, but was released after several hours. In the aftermath of the shooting, several other witnesses came forward. There were alleged sightings of the culprit getting onto a bus that was heading into the center of the city, while several other members of the public saw a man fitting the description of the perpetrator getting into a green Morris mascot, also known as a Mini Cooper, a short distance away from the house. One of these witnesses was a butcher, while another was a driving instructor. The driving instructor was in her car, with her name written on the side of her vehicle. Oddly, just days after the incident, her mother-in-law received a phone call where a person said, quote, I think we both know about the shooting in Hoibier. The caller believed they were speaking with the driving instructor, However, this strange call brought the investigation no further forward. The murder weapon was determined to be a Walter P-38 pistol, which was a German World War II era weapon and one of the most common handguns in Denmark at the time. The ammunition, however, provided local law enforcement with much more interesting information. The bullets were, at the time, mostly used by West German police officers. Around 2,000 pieces were imported to Denmark, 1,500 of which were sold to the Danish military. The remaining 500 pieces were sold to a shop in Copenhagen, which kept records of its sales. Unfortunately, despite this, authorities were unable to identify the perpetrator by use of these records. More interestingly still, the ammo which was sold to the military was given to officers with P-38s who were carrying out service in Greenland. Those who were dispatched to Greenland were first trained at a military base near the Lockhansen's villa. Other than the witness sightings and the murder weapon, the Danish police didn't have much to go on. Although 40 detectives were assigned to Marie's case, they were mostly inexperienced due to the low crime rate in the area. The crime scene was reportedly never secured, and according to some sources, key witnesses were never interviewed in depth. The murder of Marie Lockhansen is one of Denmark's biggest and most mysterious unsolved crimes. Over the decades, 20,000 people have been questioned, and police have spent over 100,000 hours investigating the grisly crime. And yet, no arrests have ever been made, no charges ever brought, and Marie's case largely remains cold. But although a lack of solid evidence appears to be a prominent hurdle in the case, the investigation has many theories and several compelling suspects. In February of 1967, just months before Marie's death, a man named Christian Andersen was found dead in his apartment in Sonnebal, about two hours from Marie. Anderson was 71 years old and owned an antique shop and was well known for flaunting his wealth, especially down at the local pub where he would often make a display of his plump wallet. It's for this very reason that when authorities found him beaten and missing his wallet, they suspected it was a case of robbery gone wrong. 
When they later found his name in one of Marie's notebooks, along with his phone number, they dismissed this, believing it was simply because the young woman had purchased goods from him before his passing. It has been rumored, however, that the two were involved with much more sinister dealings than the exchange of goods and services. In 1976, a man named Frede Müller was convicted of spying for East Germany. Müller was known as a friend and associate of Andersen's. This has led many to speculate that perhaps all three were involved in some sort of espionage. However, Müller passed away shortly after his conviction, so it's unknown if Andersen was a spy or whether or not Marie was ever involved in their activities. Many of the theories from this point on involve Oscar, an odd marriage contract, and the witness sightings of the Green Morris Mini. It is widely reported that following Marie's demise, Oscar told the media that the couple had a happy and fulfilling marriage. However, according to friends, family, and law enforcement, this was not the case, and the marriage was tense, verging on the edge of a breakdown. Reportedly, Marie had met somebody else, although one article mentions that no trace of another lover was ever found. In recent months, the couple had come up with a contract that, in case of divorce, Marie would get everything, including the villa and all of her husband's wealth. While the contract had been signed by both parties, it would only be valid after it had been registered in a court proceeding. This registration was allegedly meant to take place on the day of Marie's passing. While it is unclear why Oscar would agree to such a bizarre document, online sleuths have suggested that perhaps Marie wanted it drawn up because she found out that he was having an affair, not the other way around. To secure her own future and financial stability, she demanded that the contract be made and validated. It has also been noted that Oscar was a rather heavy drinker in the years before Marie's death. It's possible she was worried he would eventually become reckless with the money. For his part, Oscar was said to be heartbroken after losing Marie. Upon hearing of her demise and reaching the villa, he collapsed to the floor, crying, and said they killed her. In the aftermath of the tragedy, he leaned more heavily on the drink, becoming a full-blown alcoholic and eventually passing away in the 1980s. He never remarried. Some have said he died of a broken heart. Despite Oscar's heartbreak, his statement of they killed her at the crime scene as he broke down is curious if nothing else, making it sound like he knew more than he was letting on. It's been theorized that perhaps Oscar went to visit his lawyer to find out how he could get out of the contract, but his lawyer told him there was nothing he could do. Following this, Oscar's lawyer decided to visit Marie for himself and have a word. Maybe he planned on attempting to bargain with her on behalf of his client. Instead, he ended up shooting her. The lawyer, who was a very high profile one at the time, reportedly told authorities that his car had been stolen just days before the murder. The car was a green Morris Mini. It was eventually located but authorities deemed that the vehicle had nothing to do with the crime. This lawyer also had a watertight alibi, as he was away in the United States at the time of the murder. While he was away, his client's affairs were handled by his business partner, Hugo Schmidt, whose description matched the one Irma gave of the perpetrator. He was 39 at the time of the crime, owned a P-38 pistol, and had access to the Morris Mini, which was always left in the office car park. While the gun was test fired, it was found to not be a match to the murder weapon. Despite this piece of information, many still believe that either one or both of the lawyers were involved in the crime. In recent years, the couple's odd contract was located by authorities. Attached to it was a note, which said it should not be given to the police. It was signed with initials matching those of Hugo Schmidt. Irma told authorities that while Schmidt looked similar to the killer, he was not the same man. As for the first lawyer, it appears that Irma never met him, but the pair did speak over the phone. 
Another major theory in Marie's case is that she was murdered by a man for attempting to disinherit his son. In 1947, Oscar found out that he was infertile, which was strange since his wife had already birthed him a son named Steen. On the back of this knowledge, he found out that his first wife, Vera, had been having an affair with a politician and friend of his named Jorgen Peter Anderson. The couple divorced, but Oscar agreed to keep up the pretense that Steen was his true son, otherwise he would face embarrassment and public scrutiny. Following the pair's split, Steen continued to live with his mother instead of his father, but upon Oscar's death, would still be entitled to his estate along with Lisbeth. However, if Marie and Oscar's contract went through, then Steen and Lisbeth would essentially be disinherited. Many have suggested the idea that Jorgen either killed Marie himself or had a hitman do it for him. If a professional was involved in the murder, it could explain why it was so clean and explain why Marie was so specifically targeted. It appears that Irma was only shot for getting in the perpetrator's way, but that they did not intend on harming anyone else other than their target. It has also been speculated that perhaps this was the work of a hitman, but that they took the life of the wrong person. This links to the final theory in Marie's case, that it was a case of mistaken identity. Some have noticed how similar Marie looked to a Danish traitor named Greta Bartram, a woman who worked as an agent and informant for the Gestapo during the war. In the years following the crime, Irma reportedly ran into the perpetrator twice more, once in a shopping center and once outside of a building. On both occasions, the man was allegedly gone by the time authorities arrived. However, neither Irma's children nor authorities have ever confirmed these sightings. Shortly before her death, aged 87 in 2003, Irma was shown two further photos of potential suspects, but neither was the man she had seen on November 10th of 1967. In fact, she told authorities they had already shown her one of the photos before, and indeed they had, way back in 1968. Over the decades, dozens of journalists and authors have covered Marie's case. A multitude of books, documentaries, and articles have been created about it, but none have ever led authorities any closer to solving it once and for all. It was such a shocking and sensational case that it was dubbed the murder case that won't die. With the years moving on, it sadly seems likely that we will never see the case resolved. Connor and Sheila Dwyer. The sudden vanishing of a married couple from County Cork in 1991 has baffled both amateur detectives and local authorities alike. The bizarre disappearance occurred almost 30 years ago, but still, there are no answers in this extremely cold case. Connor and Sheila Dwyer lived and worked in Fermoy, County Cork in 1991. Connor, 63, had previously been employed as a plumber and handyman, but had most recently taken up work as a chauffeur for a wealthy German businessman named Fritz Wolf, who was holidaying in a nearby village. According to reports, Connor was having the time of his life in this occupation, as it allowed him to drive the flashy cars he had been dreaming of owning since he was just a child. Their neighborhood was not the most affluent, meaning neighbors didn't miss the shiny Rolls Royce that sometimes sat at the front of their house. It wasn't subtle, and it stuck out like a sore thumb. While Connor was in his element with his new career path, Sheila, 61, was a homemaker. The couple's two grown children had since left the nest, both choosing to move to England, but Sheila kept herself busy throughout the day with cooking, errand running, and other household tasks. Friends and neighbors noted that she was always well-dressed and made a consistent effort with her appearance. Nothing seemed amiss in the pair's life when they suddenly stopped answering their telephone and vanished one day from their home without a trace. Connor and Sheila were last seen attending a funeral at St. Patrick's Church in Fermoy on April 30th, 1991. The church was just 100 meters from the couple's Chapel Hill home, and they made it back safely. That evening, Sheila spoke with one of her sisters on the phone. 
it is unclear when exactly the Dwyers vanished. The last time anyone spoke to the couple was on May 1st, when again, one of Sheila's sisters spoke to her on the phone, but subsequent calls to the residence went unanswered. There are conflicting reports about when the couple were reported missing. Some sources say May 19th, while others say May 22nd. Either way, it's clear there is a gap of around three weeks in which the pair's movements are not accounted for. It's unclear why nobody reported the couple missing, not friends, nor family, nor neighbors during that time. One of the Dwyer's children, also named Connor, said he had last spoken to his parents on St. Patrick's Day. March 17th, he reported that nothing had seen amiss with the couple. The Dwyers were finally reported missing when one of Sheila's sisters went to the home after failing to contact either half of the couple. She was met with a silent, empty house, and she alerted the local authorities. When the Garda arrived on the scene, they immediately began to investigate. Nothing seemed out of place, and nothing was missing. There were no signs of a struggle or forced entry. The couple's personal belongings, including clothes and passports, were found in the home. A biscuit tin kept in the house still contained around 2,100 euros. The only thing the Garda couldn't locate was the couple themselves and their car, a white Toyota with the registration plate 5797ZT. In the years since their disappearance, no trace of the Dwyers has ever been found. Their bank accounts have never been accessed, and their car has never been located. Since the River Blackwater runs through the town, authorities conducted an exhaustive search of the water and the surrounding countryside, all to no avail. Shortly after their vanishing, Interpol was alerted and ferry records were combed through for any sign of either the couple's car or their presence on any of the ships. But once again, this lead was a dead end and no sign of the Dwyers was found. Although there have been no confirmed sightings of the couple since 1991, several witnesses stepped forward in the years following their disappearance, claiming to have seen them alive and well. One local woman believed she had seen the pair in their car stopped at a set of traffic lights in Fermoy, just shortly after the couple were thought to have vanished. There have also been different sightings in the cities of Dublin and Waterford. In 1993, the case was featured on an episode of Crime Call, the Irish equivalent to UK's Crime Watch program. After seeing the show, a woman reported seeing the couple at Lourdes Airport in France in June of 1991. She said that the man appeared suspicious because he wore a long trench coat and kept a constant, careful eye on his wife while he went to grab a newspaper. She thought it seemed like he was worried the woman would talk to somebody else while she sat and waited for his return. She said when the man returned to his wife, he said something to her and they both left. The witness claimed that the couple both had Irish accents. At the time, she was unaware of the missing pair and thus didn't report the sighting sooner. She added that she was later interviewed by authorities with one of Sheila's sisters and that apparently the clothing she had described matched the clothing that was missing from the house, presumably the clothing the couple had worn when they went missing, as no other garments were reported as gone from the home. Another interesting sighting came that same year in 1993, when a witness recalled seeing the pair at a Munich airport. This conversation was particularly interesting to the Garda, considering before his disappearance, Connor had been working for a German businessman. However, neither the Bavarian police department nor Interpol could confirm this sighting. Another unclear detail in the couple's case was whether or not Connor was working for Fritz Wolf at the time of his vanishing, or if he had stopped, perhaps because Wolf had returned to Germany. If Connor was still under Wolf's employment when he went missing, why had Wolf not reported his driver as missing? In the year 2000, new information led authorities to search a lime quarry about 45 minutes from Fermoy. However, this search turned up no new leads. One of the most curious aspects of the case is that it is shrouded in rumor and hearsay. Reddit forum users have noticed their family's reluctance to discuss the case, while accusations range from Connor orchestrating a murder-suicide plot to the 63-year-old being involved accidentally in a drug-running business. 
One particularly interesting whisper involves Connor disappearing for several years back in the 1980s. It is unclear where this rumor started, and it is unknown why he left or returned if the rumor is true. It's also been speculated that the couple took their own lives together in a suicide pact. This theory arose because Connor's brother mentioned that he had suffered from depression before. If Connor really did disappear in the prior decade, then perhaps his mental health struggles played a role in that too. One theory in the case postulates that the couple's vanishing is linked to the disappearance of William Billy Fennessy, who vanished from Fermoy almost exactly a year prior. William was of a similar age and his car was also missing. However, his body and car were both pulled from the River Blackwater in 2013. The theory that appears to be the most likely is that the couple suffered the same tragic fate as William Fennessy, but their vehicle and bodies have simply not yet been found. The couple's more outspoken son, Connor, claimed in a 2008 interview that his parents had no enemies and were not disliked. They were friendly and respectable and well-known in the community. He also noted his belief that they were still alive, but added, the not knowing keeps you awake at night. I wonder what the hell was going through their minds. There's a void of information. It's very bizarre and inexplicable. It is a living nightmare. There have been very few updates in the couple's case in recent years. There have never been any suspects or theories announced to the public, and authorities have stated their belief that the couple's vehicle is likely the key to the case. Until then, the disappearance of Sheila and Connor Dwyer remains unsolved. If you have any information on the vanishing of the Dwyers, you can contact the Fermoy Garda on 025-821-00. Mary Boyle. If you're an Irish viewer, you are likely familiar with the name Mary Boyle. The missing six-year-old's case is not only controversial, but also extremely tragic. Mary has been dubbed Ireland's Madeleine McCann in recent years. Her vanishing is the longest running missing child case in the Republic of Ireland. Born June 14th of 1970, Mary Boyle was a vibrant and talkative little girl. She had an older brother, Paddy, and a twin sister, Anne. Mary and Anne were reportedly inseparable, with Mary being the boldest of the two. Although originally born in Birmingham, the young girl moved with her family to Ballyshannon in Ireland in the early 70s. Mary was last seen at around 3.30 p.m. on March 18th, 1977. She was playing with her cousins and siblings near her grandparents' rural farm, which the family had been visiting since St. Patrick's Day on the 17th. While playing, the six-year-old saw her uncle heading off with a ladder, which he was returning to a neighbor, and she decided to tag along. However, her journey was cut short when the two came across a large bog. Defeated, Mary turned back to return home. The trip should have lasted no more than five minutes, but the little girl never returned home. Mary's uncle stayed at the neighbor's farm for around 30 minutes, engaged in conversation with the occupants. Meanwhile, her family began to search for the six-year-old, scouring the local area and questioning passers-by. In one article by the Irish Independent newspaper, a fisherman reported seeing Mary being snatched by somebody in a red Volkswagen Beetle. However, this witness apparently clarified his statement on a BBC podcast by stating that he had not seen Mary being taken, but he had seen a suspicious red vehicle in the area at the time. When the Garda arrived on the scene, they sprung into action, draining bogs in the area in an attempt to uncover her body. The lake behind Mary's grandparents' house was also drained, and authorities filmed a reconstruction of her last known movements using her twin sister, Anne. A famous Irish country music star named Margot O'Donnell, who was a friend and distant relative of the family, caught wind of the case and funded searches for Mary on the surrounding hillside by selling new music. Searches have been regularly carried out since 1977, but so far, Mary has never been located. Mary's case is extremely controversial. 
there are unclear details, conflicting reports, and allegations of corruption surrounding it. It is widely believed that a politician stopped law enforcement from detaining and questioning a prime suspect in the case. Thus, it has never been solved. One of the loudest voices supporting this belief is a right-wing journalist named Gemma O'Doherty. O'Doherty is a determined journalist who has not only written about the case in publications, but has also created a documentary about the disappearance called Mary Boyle, The Untold Truth. The documentary is available to watch on YouTube, although O'Doherty herself was banned from the platform in 2019 for repeatedly violating YouTube's hate speech policies. O'Doherty is largely considered to be a controversial character herself. She is known to be a racist anti-vaxxer with anti-LGBTQ beliefs. Reportedly, her news gathering ethics have also been called into question in the past. That said, her theory pertaining to Mary's case can't be entirely discredited, as there are several pieces of evidence supporting corruption and a cover-up. In her documentary, Gemma suggests the theory that Mary was sexually abused and murdered. Her sister Anne and several other relatives have publicly claimed that they know what happened to the six-year-old and they know who the culprit is. Anne supports O'Doherty's theory and says the perpetrator is still alive and still living in the country. In the documentary, Anne can be heard saying, I believe Mary had a secret. I believe Mary had to be killed to stop her telling. However, this claim has not come without a cost. Anne no longer speaks to her mother and the Boyle family is largely divided as a result of their split beliefs. In 2016, the twins' mother, also called Anne, called the appeals, the most ridiculous carry-on I have ever seen in my life. Margot O'Donnell recalled asking the politician, the one who allegedly stopped the interview with the prime suspect, if he had done such a thing. The politician denied any involvement and branded Margot a bare-faced liar. The initial suspect was released without charge and does not appear to have ever been named in any newspaper reports. According to O'Doherty, the politician was not only friends with the suspect, but also had a good relationship with the superintendent who was in charge of the case. A detective sergeant named Aidan Murray has also confirmed that he was close to a confession from the prime suspect when a superior officer ordered him to rein it in. Murray added that he had also witnessed the call between the politician and law enforcement, which instructed the guarder not to question the suspect further. The politician who intervened in the Mary Boyle case is alleged to have been a man named Sean McKenniff, who passed away in 2017. When still alive, McKenniff was supposedly surrounded by accusations of sexual abuse and grooming. Mary's uncle, Jerry Gallagher, reportedly worked for him. Many believe that Jerry Gallagher is responsible for the disappearance of his niece. Anne Boyle has never outright accused her uncle, but armchair detectives have put two and two together. According to O'Doherty's documentary, Gallagher gave conflicting statements over the years and apparently didn't even admit that Mary had been with him when she initially went missing. The documentary is not without its criticisms, even from those who starred in it, but it does give viewers some compelling information. Even if no politicians were involved, it appears that law enforcement's efforts to find the murderer of a six-year-old girl were severely lacking. Other suspects in Mary's case are few and far between. In 2014, a man named Brian McCann, who had been jailed for two years for several sex offenses just a few years before, was pulled in for questioning, but later released without charge. He has publicly denied any involvement with the six-year-old's disappearance. Another man who was considered a suspect for a time was the infamous Scottish serial killer and paedophile, Robert Black. He was thought to have been involved when authorities discovered that he was a cross-border truck driver who, as part of his job, often visited that same county from which Mary vanished. He was even known to have been in the area at the time of her disappearance. One witness even claimed they heard crying coming from the back of his van which was parked outside of a pub in the village of Anagri. However, he has since been dismissed as a suspect. Mary's case, according to the Garda, is not cold. 
although the family have little faith in law enforcement and don't believe they will ever see justice. In 2018, a silent protest was held outside the coroner's office in the town of Stranola. Participants aimed to force the coroner to hold an inquest into Mary's disappearance, allowing key witnesses to be interviewed on the public record for the first time. Protesters also handed in a petition with 10,000 signatures, demanding an inquest be held. This does not appear to have been successful, however. There are claims that Mary's mother has continually denied any inquests into the six-year-old's disappearance. There are many theories in Mary's case. Most believe that Jerry Gallagher was involved and that O'Doherty's cover-up theory is truthful. Others have pointed to the suspicious actions of Mary's mother and suggested that the parents helped cover up the crime in some way. It's also been postulated that the six-year-old was involved in an accident, but nobody wanted to admit it, or that perhaps Mary never even left the cottage at all, suggesting she was killed in the home. Mary's father passed away in a fishing accident in 2005. The rest of the family remains split by their opinions on what really happened to the little girl. To this day, her case is still unsolved. Catrice Lee. Born on November 28th of 1979, Catrice Lee was the light of her parents' lives. She was endlessly doted on by her family and was expected to have a bright and happy future. Catrice was born at the British Military Hospital in Rinteln, West Germany. The daughter of Richard Lee, a sergeant in the cavalry regiment of the British Army and his wife Sharon, Catrice spent the first two years of her life in Germany, although at the time of her vanishing, she spoke only English. On November 28th of 1981, Catrice turned two. The family made plans to visit the Naffy shopping complex nearby to buy things for the little girl's party. Sharon's sister, Wendy, and her husband, Cliff, traveled to the city to celebrate the occasion. Catrice's big sister, Natasha, didn't want to go shopping, however, so she stayed behind with her uncle Cliff, while Wendy, Richard, and Sharon took Catrice with them. As it was the last payday before Christmas, the shopping center was bustling with activity. Sharon carried her daughter around as she didn't want to sit in the shopping trolley, while Richard remained in the car, waiting for his wife and sister to finish up. Finally, the two women reached the checkout. Sharon put her daughter down when she realized that she'd forgotten to get crisps. Trusting that Wendy would keep an eye on her, she left to get the item. However, when she returned, two-year-old Catrice was gone. Meanwhile, Wendy thought that the little girl had followed her mother down the aisle. That was when they realized that Catrice had disappeared. While the military police were in charge of the case, they had to negotiate with the German civil police because the shopping center was in town and not technically on the military's premises. Both agencies agreed that Catrice had likely fallen into the nearby River Lippe and drowned, but her body was never located in the river, which was later dredged. No evidence of her appeared there either. The Lees, for their part, slammed this theory asking how authorities expected a two-year-old child to make her way from one store in a shopping complex all the way outside and into the river. To add to tensions between both agencies and the family and law enforcement, the German police reportedly refused to go to the press with the story. Six weeks passed before an article on Catrice appeared in the local paper. Despite searching the river thoroughly and conducting door-to-door -door inquiries, no leads turned up in the early months of the investigation, and the case was eventually closed. It was reopened in 2000, when authorities were able to produce a computer-generated image of what Catrice may look like at age 21. This new spotlight on the case prompted witnesses who'd previously not been interviewed to come forward, including a young man who was in the queue behind the Lees and a checkout employee. Then, a woman came forward with an eerie tale of her own. According to the woman, her boyfriend, who was in the same regiment as Catrice's father, had confessed to murdering a child. At the time this information came to light, the man was living in Northumberland. Military police did question the individual, 
but he denied admitting to any such thing and denied being involved with the disappearance. The woman who had initially reported him passed away soon after, essentially closing the lead. Law enforcement told the Lees that the man was likely a fantasist and had likely not been involved in the disappearance of their daughter. Catrice's story was featured on two BBC programs, Crime Watch and Missing Live. On Missing Live, a digital rendering of what the little girl would look like as a grown woman at 29 years old was shown. On Crime Watch, her older sister Natasha appealed to the public for information. Several tips came in and leads were followed, but ultimately all led nowhere. After the Crime Watch episode aired, an anonymous woman left a message on Richard Lee's answering machine, telling him to look for his daughter in France. While authorities took the tape into their possession to investigate the caller and the lead, nothing more came of it. One line of inquiry that was followed by law enforcement was the idea that Catrice had been abducted from the complex to be raised by another family, possibly in Germany or the UK, or perhaps elsewhere in Europe. She was likely unaware of her true identity. Since Catrice had been born with a unique eye condition, in which her left eye would have required two surgeries, an appeal was made to medical personnel with knowledge of such operations to come forward if they had operated on a child. This lead sadly appears to have gone nowhere, however. In April of 2018, the British military police and the German civil police announced that they would be undertaking a five-week forensic search on the banks of the river, but this sadly produced no new evidence. In September of 2019, a former serviceman in Swindon was arrested in connection with the case, and his property was searched, but he was subsequently released. A month later, in October of 2019, a 40-year-old woman pled guilty to a malicious communications offence after pretending to be Catrice online and contacting the family. She was sentenced to 18 weeks in jail ordered to undergo mental health treatment, and was banned from contacting the family via a restraining order. The only real lead in Catrice's case was made in 2017, when an eFit, an electronic facial identification technique, was released of a man the police wished to speak to. This man was reportedly seen at the time of the two-year-old's vanishing, carrying a small child into a green saloon vehicle. A similar car was seen near the River Alm in the days following the disappearance, which prompted authorities to investigate the riverbank the following year. In December of 2020, authorities announced that they would be scaling back the investigation, much to the disappointment of the Lee family. The police told Richard that they would only investigate going forward if new evidence was found. Richard, who believes that his daughter was taken by someone, has been very vocal over the last four decades about how the initial investigation into the disappearance was botched. He said, I believe the whole investigation has been a complete and utter sham. He added that it took six weeks for checkout employees to be interviewed, and in one case, it took 20 years for the person to be questioned. He also noted that 48 hours had passed before border control was alerted to the fact that a child was missing and it took a full day before sniffer dogs were brought in. On the whole, the investigation has been heavily criticized for the fact that many key witnesses' interviews were delayed and that 36 years had gone by before the e-fit of the suspect was released. Catrice is still missing, and her case is still unsolved. Richard Lee, now 71, continues to actively campaign for justice alongside the rest of his family. If Catrice is still alive, she will be 42 years old. If you have any information regarding her potential whereabouts, please call 0800 616 888. Duan Sims The vanishing of four-year-old Duan Christian Sims is perhaps one of Michigan's most tragic unsolved cases. It is also rife with rumors, speculation, and unanswered questions. Duan went missing on December 11th of 1994. According to his mother, Duana, the pair had visited the Wonderland Mall in Livonia together and were walking 
when he vanished somewhere along the corridor between the Target store and the main area of the center at around 2.30 PM. Little more is known about the exact circumstances in which Dewan went missing. Upon hearing Dwana's story, investigators were immediately suspicious. They administered two polygraph tests shortly after the vanishing and Dwana failed both. However, we must note that so-called lie detector tests are not foolproof and are inadmissible in most courts. Still, authorities believe that something was off with Dwana. They have stated on several occasions that they don't believe Dewan was ever in the mall. Dewana was questioned for 18 hours after her son's vanishing and both her car and her home were searched, all to no avail. Although the center had 12 CCTV cameras, not one of them picked up the four-year-old. Reportedly, when Dwana was shown the footage, she pointed to a mother and child and said it was her and Dewan, but this was found to be false because the pair's clothing did not line up with what Dwana and her son were wearing at the time. Witnesses also placed the young woman as arriving alone at around 3.30 PM, and some sources state that this was also captured on CCTV. Throughout the decades since the four-year-old vanished, Dwana has maintained her innocence. In 1995, she told the media that she had begun attending therapy sessions as a way to help her cope with the disappearance of her son. Her mother noted that Dwana had been emotionally devastated by the incident. She also said that she had a life insurance policy on Dwan, but that Dwana knew nothing about it. She said she had intended to use the money to help Dwan pay for university in the future. Meanwhile, Dwan's father, who is largely absent in most of the articles covering the story and who appears to have kept a very low profile after his son's disappearance, passed a polygraph test administered by law enforcement. He has never been considered a suspect and told authorities that he believed Dwana was a good mother. During their search for the four-year-old, the police checked along railroad tracks, relatives' homes, abandoned buildings, and even dumpsters and other trash containers. They searched on foot and with ATVs and used sniffer dogs. A multi-agency task force investigated over 1,200 tips, one of which claimed Dewan was alive and living in Florida. Still, no trace of him has ever been found. In 1999, the police received a tip from another law enforcement agency, which led them to excavate an area in Hines Park in Dearborn Heights, Michigan. Here, they found a buried bag of bones. However, DNA testing proved that the remains were not Dewan's. That same year, the four-year-old was briefly thought to be Dennis, the DeKalb County Jane Doe who was found in a cemetery in Georgia, but he was ruled out as a potential match. In the early 2000s, the Wonderland Mall was demolished. Locals believed that the remains of Dewan would be found in the rubble, but they never were. In 2019, a man named Mike Cash went to Livonia Police to give a DNA sample, believing that he was the missing toddler. Authorities had learned of Cash via his Facebook posts, in which he stated his belief that he really was Dewan Sims. He also accused his parents of lying to him about certain aspects of his life. Reportedly, Cash had previously reached out to Dwana, but she had blocked him upon discovering he could not answer questions about his birthday or the birthmarks he would have on his body if he was truly her son. While authorities suggested to Dwana that the pair meet, she said that she was uncomfortable with that idea. She did, however, give her own DNA and seemingly cooperated with this investigation. However, the results of Cash's DNA test are still unknown as the lab in which they were being tested in shut down during the 2020 pandemic. Both authorities and Dwana noted that they were skeptical of Cash's claims. There has been very little progress in Dwana's case over the years. Following his vanishing, Dwana moved to North Carolina where she remarried and had two more children. She passed away in December of 2020 and we are still no closer to uncovering the truth about what happened to her son. Dwana told the media that she felt the investigation had been hindered early on because of both racial prejudices and the Susan Smith case, which occurred around the same time, in which a woman reported her children as being kidnapped, but then confessed to killing them a week later. 
It likely did not help her public image when she was convicted in 1996 for threatening her husband with two knives during a domestic dispute. There have been many sightings of Dewan over the years, but so far, none have panned out. Authorities have said that although Dwana has passed away, the case is still open and they are investigating. Although there is little evidence available, there are many theories being discussed online. Most people believe that Dwana is in some way responsible for whatever happened to her son. It's been theorized that she sold Dwan or traded him to pay off debt, or that a partner of hers was violent and hurt him, or maybe that he was killed accidentally or died while unattended. Others have speculated that Dwana had some sort of mental break or that she had left him in the car while she went into the mall and he was abducted from her vehicle. It is sadly possible we may never know what happened to the four-year-old boy, especially given the huge lack of physical evidence. Authorities reportedly have their own theories about what happened to Dwan, but they won't disclose what these are. If you have any information on the whereabouts of Dewan Sims, you can contact the Livonia PD at 734-466-2470. If Dewan is still alive, he will be 30 this year. Maureen Dutton. The unsolved murder of Maureen Dutton in 1961 is perhaps one of Liverpool's most shocking and gruesome cold cases. Maureen was just 27 at the time of her death and was a typical English housewife. Her husband, Brian, was a research chemist who worked for the Imperial Chemical Industry Company, often shortened to the ICI. Just three weeks earlier, Maureen had given birth to the couple's second child, Andrew. They already had a two-year-old, a little boy named David. By all accounts, the couple had a happy marriage and lived a normal life, which is perhaps why Maureen's murder was all the more disturbing and shocking to the local community. On December 21st, 1961, Maureen stayed home all day at the couple's house on Thingwall Lane in the area of Knotty Ash. She had intended on taking David to visit the nearby Childwall Parish Church, but she didn't want to take Andrew, as it was cold and foggy out, so she called her mother-in-law, Elsie, and asked her to babysit later that day. However, Elsie had to cancel the arrangement because the fog had gotten so thick she was unable to traverse it, and so Maureen's plans were abandoned, and she stayed home with her children. She was last known to be alive at around 1.30 p.m. that afternoon. Just after 6 p.m., Brian returned home from work and was immediately suspicious when he was greeted with both darkness and silence. With two young children, the house was never quiet. Maureen was always bustling about, carrying out household tasks while caring for her two young boys. Brian's suspicions grew when he saw the family's half-eaten lunch still on the kitchen table. He moved through to the living room and it was there he found his family. In the middle of the room was Maureen. She had been stabbed 14 times in the chest, throat, and back. It is widely believed that David, who was sitting nearby, dazed and gazing at his mother, witnessed the crime. Andrew was in his crib nearby. The children were thought to have been alone for the best part of six hours. Investigators at the Old Swan Police Station immediately launched an inquiry into the horrific slaying of the mother of two. They believed a long-bladed knife was the murder weapon and searched nearby bushes and shrubs for any sign of the object. They even searched drains on the streets, but turned up nothing. There was no obvious forensic evidence available. Maureen had not been sexually assaulted and there was no signs of forced entry, nor had anything been taken from the home, all of which made it difficult for authorities to pinpoint the motive. After carrying out door-to-door -door inquiries, police discovered that nobody had been seen coming or going from the home, and nobody had heard screaming or a struggle. Then, a young woman came forward with an interesting story. After seeing the newspaper report of Maureen's death, the young woman, who lived in nearby Halewood, told authorities that she had been visited by a young man who claimed to be a doctor. Like Maureen, the young woman had recently given birth. She assumed that the doctor had been sent to check on her as part of her postnatal care, but this was not the case. 
After her husband returned from work, she told him that the doctor had indecently assaulted her, which prompted her husband to make inquiries about the so-called doctor. He was told that there was no doctor operating in the area at that time. The man was described as being between the ages of 27 and 30, wearing horn-rimmed glasses and a dark grey overcoat. On the back of this information, police theorized that Maureen had let the killer into her home under the belief that he was some kind of professional, like a doctor or a nurse. Perhaps the 27-year-old had fought back when he tried to sexually assault her, and the culprit flew into a rage and attacked her with the knife. Another strange possible suspect in the case was that of the quote, good-looking stranger. This man was described as being rather young and wearing a leather jacket. He was seen several times in the vicinity of the street on the day of the crime. Witnesses saw him running very fast down the road that afternoon, and not long afterwards, he was seen being violently sick outside of the Court Hay Methodist Church. One onlooker noted that the man kept his hands in his pockets the entire time he was vomiting, which they thought was very peculiar. One woman claimed they'd seen the man on the day of the incident. He had knocked on her door and stood before her clapping his hands. Frightened, the woman slammed the door on him and locked it. By January 17th, the police had gathered over 20,000 statements. With the help of witnesses, they put together a composite image of what they thought the man might have looked like. The Liverpool Echo featured the picture on the front of their paper, and within the first 24 hours of it being published, 60 people contacted authorities with information. However, the names that were given to the police were steadily eliminated, and the man in the leather jacket was never identified. The next suspect in the case was a young blonde woman who was seen acting suspiciously when she boarded a bus close to the crime scene. This unidentified woman boarded the number 10D bus on East Prescott Road. She reportedly had an Irish accent and muttered about how she needed to leave the city immediately. Upon exiting the bus, she repeatedly said, oh my God, the woman has never been traced and never come forward. The most bizarre theory to ever be explored in Maureen's case was done so by investigators acting under the orders of Deputy Chief Constable of Liverpool, a man named Herbert Barmer. He theorized that the 27-year-old housewife had been executed in a sacrificial killing by a Polynesian cult. Several of the cult's followers lived in Liverpool, and it was believed that they were making sacrifices to their god Tiki during the winter solstice, the time period in which Maureen was slain. The members were also known to have a tattoo of a reversed swastika. Whether this theory holds any weight at all is unknown, but it is what the deputy chief constable believed. Eventually, authorities landed on a suspect by following this theory. A 24-year-old nurse living in Upper Parliament Street was arrested and charged for stealing equipment and drugs from three Liverpool hospitals in 1962. He reportedly pretended to be a doctor, and had the reversed swastika tattoo. However, the man was subsequently ruled out as being involved with the murder of Maureen, and the entire theory was abandoned. Authorities regularly review the files and evidence in Maureen's case, and made a fresh appeal for information as recently as 2016. Despite authorities uncovering numerous compelling suspects, Maureen's case remains unsolved. If the culprit is still alive today, it's likely they are at least in their 70s, meaning it is unlikely authorities will be able to bring them to justice. Lynn Bryant. At the time of her passing in 1998, Lynn Bryant was a mother of two who had been planning her 41st birthday celebrations. Although her case received tremendous amounts of media attention at the time, it has all but disappeared from the minds of the public today. Described by her loved ones as popular, sociable, and family-oriented, Lynn was well-liked and well-known by locals in the village where she lived, Ruan High Lanes in South Cornwall. She had two daughters, 19-year-old Erin and 21-year-old Lee, who just had her own first child. The 10-month-old baby was Lynn's first grandchild, and she was looking forward to seeing her family continue to grow in the future. On the morning of Tuesday, October 20th, 1998, Lynn went to work as usual. She was a cleaner for a nearby house. 
Upon finishing, the 40-year-old dropped in to visit her parents before returning home. At around 12.45 p.m., Lynn drove her gray Ford Sierra to Harris Garage at the village of Tregony, but she found out they were out of fuel. Next, she drove to Chenoweth Garage at Ruan High Lanes, where she bought milk, gas, and a few groceries. While there, a scruffy white car-derived van was seen entering the forecourt. It was driven by an unknown bearded man. Law enforcement later noted that a similar vehicle had been seen in the days before Lynn's death, but both it and the driver were unknown to locals in the area. After visiting the garage, Lynn had lunch with her daughter, Erin. The pair chatted about Lynn's upcoming birthday and watched Emmerdale between 1 and 1.30 p.m. Just after half past one, the 40-year-old took the family dog, a lurcher named Jay, out for a walk. Her family told authorities that Lynn always took the same route. Several witnesses reported seeing her on her way and told law enforcement later that nothing seemed amiss. A passing motorist saw Lynn talking to a man at the junction by Ruan High Lane's Methodist Chapel. The man is described as being clean shaven in his 30s, about five foot nine, and wearing light colored clothing. This is the last known sighting of Lynn alive. At 12.30 p.m., Lynn's body was found by a woman driving up the lane between the chapel and Treville's Manor. Panicked, the woman reversed her car back down the road and alerted a local farmer who recognized the body. While emergency services were called, by the time the air ambulance arrived at 2.50 p.m., Lynn was long dead. She had sustained multiple knife wounds to her neck and back, with the fatal blow striking her in the chest. Authorities noted that the 40-year-old had fought her attacker viciously and that her clothing was disturbed, which led them to believe she had been the victim of a sexually motivated assault. Law enforcement determined that the murder weapon was a single-edged blade between 10 and 14 centimeters long. It was likely either a pen knife or a small kitchen knife, but so far it has never been located. Despite the fact that police immediately carried out a fingertip search of the area, after Lynn's body was found. One interesting clue found at the scene was the vivid blue polyester cotton mix fibers that were located on Lynn's body. The fibers have never been matched to a specific garment, but are commonly used in both polo shirts and sweatshirts. They are alien to Lynn and her home, leading investigators to conclude that they must have come from the perpetrator. Authorities also stated that due to the struggle and the mud splatter found on the 40-year-old's clothing, they believe the culprit would have mud and blood on their clothing. Another local farmer told the police that he'd seen a man walking across his field between 2.45 and 3 p.m. This was unusual to him because there was no footpath across the area and it was never used by walkers. He noted that the man wasn't dressed for a walk or a hike either, wearing regular, everyday clothing instead. Another bizarre incident that occurred in Lynn's case was that of her tortoise shell glasses, which she had been wearing when she left the house earlier, but were not found on or with her body. They also did not turn up when the police searched the area. Four months later, however, on February 2nd of 1999, the glasses were located, sitting on top of the murder at the gateway where the mother of two's body was found. Authorities have been unable to determine where they came from, suspecting that either a member of the public found them or that the perpetrator of the crime had taken them as a trophy and, for some reason, returned them afterwards. The investigation into Lynn's horrific murder was long. 3,144 house-to-house -house inquiry forms were completed, 1,600 alibis were established, 7,884 statements were taken, and 6,573 vehicles were traced and eliminated. All men between the ages of 14 and 70 who were living in a one-mile radius of the crime scene were traced and their alibis checked and cooperated. Due to the remote location of the crime scene, Authorities concluded that the culprit was either a local to the area or knew it well. Perhaps they worked nearby or had family who lived in the community. In 2015, investigators who were reviewing the case managed to pull a partial DNA profile from the evidence. Although DNA samples had been taken in 1998, authorities had to begin the process all over again with some 6,000 people in 2016. 
This was because new legislation, which had come into effect three years earlier, had compelled law enforcement to destroy the old samples. So far, however, these efforts have not led to an arrest or a conviction, although three suspects were cleared using the DNA profile. In 2018, on the 20th anniversary of Lynn's death, authorities put out a fresh appeal for information, which led them to receive 160 calls. 27 new leads involving 13 people came as a result. That same year, a reconstruction of the 40-year-old's last known movements was made and released to the public. The three men police wish to speak to have never come forward or been identified. These men include the man seen driving the white car-derived van, the man who spoke with Lynn at the chapel, and the man who was witnessed walking across the field. It's unknown if any of them have anything to do with the crime. In 2016, a former intelligence officer named Chris Clark put forward the theory that Lynn's case is linked with that of Helen Fleet and Kate Bushell, both of whom were murdered while dog walking. Kate Bushell was just 14 years old when she was found dead in Exwick, Exeter on November 15th, 1997. She had been out walking the neighbor's dog when she was found. She had a knife wound to the neck. Helen Fleet was 66 years old when she was beaten to death while walking her dogs on March 28th of 1987 in Walbury Woods in Western Supermare. Both cases have never been solved and law enforcement has never officially linked the three murders. Lynn Bryant's case also remains unsolved. 300 mourners attended her funeral at Penmount Crematorium in Truro on December of 1998. Crime Stoppers is currently offering a £10,000 reward for any information which could lead to an arrest. If you have any information about Lynn's case or Maureen's, you can contact Crime Stoppers anonymously at 0800 555 111. And there you have the facts. Please leave a comment down below with your own theories and speculations, and remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. You can also support us on Patreon for access to behind the scenes content and early access to our documentaries. Thank you for watching. Stay alert, stay safe, and I'll see you next time.